14th Amendment due process rights. I make a reservation for those rights, especially, but all rights at this time. The record to reflect that the individual known to this court as Daryl Brooks is present in person, in custody. He is appearing uh, today in street clothes. He has a dress shirt and a tie on. He's also wearing a mask. And I don't consent to being called that name for the record. <laughs> this paperwork I accept for value and return for value as it does not state the correct name. It states the name of my client, the straw man. I am not this name in all capital letters. I do not identify by that name, nor do I know that individual. Your objection is noted it's baseless in law and fact, and <coughs> that is simply a caption on a pleading uh, that on is the not my name. final jury instructions. That is not my name for the record. All right, the record should reflect, Mr. It. Brooks, I'm talking. The record should reflect that at 3.23 p.m. yesterday, all of the verdict forms were printed off and provided to Mr. Brooks. I also uh, provided him with an excerpt from the bench book on closing arguments. Um, I left a copy on the state's table as well and a second copy on the defense table today as well so that uh, I thought that would be helpful information as we are um, about that time in the proceeding for the parties to uh, give their closing arguments. Of course, prior to that, the court will be reading through the final jury instructions. Um, the parties were also given uh, the updated version following the jury instruction conference yesterday as well. Uh, the total number of pages for that is 107. The court will be reading from the first 73 pages this morning. I do anticipate having to take uh, one or two breaks before I complete all of that. I'm, my plan is to do that uh, and then take the lunch break. Uh, and then when we come back from lunch to have the parties provide their, oh, they're not opening, their closing arguments. And then following the closing arguments, uh, the court has the final uh, jury instructions which go through uh, the closing instruction, uh, instructions 460, 484, and all of the verdicts, uh, and then the instruction to the uh, jury um, 515 about their verdicts needing to be unanimous, and then um, selection of a presiding juror. The very last page, 107, actually is not read until the close of the case and only following um, receipt of verdicts or some other type of disposition that would result in the conclusion of the case. It's the instruction after the verdict is received. So uh, page 107 is not something that will be read uh, today. As indicated yesterday, I will be selecting the alternates by random selection. We'll use the tumbler um, and uh, select three numbers out of that. But that will be done after all of the instructions are read and the parties have an opportunity to give their closing arguments. Uh, Your Honor, I accept for value and return for value any uh, documents that you just alluded to. I have not seen them. Mr. Brooks, if you haven't seen them, that is by your choice. They were provided to you. I know on multiple occasions yesterday you threw items into the garbage can. Um, the court retrieved the final jury instructions. I personally didn't. I had someone do it had them placed on the table this morning and any other items you threw in the garbage. So is that is that the paperwork that I had to stay here for over an hour for? Sir, I'm not going to discuss any further what we did during the jury instruction conference. The jury is going to be brought jury out instruction a little conference. bit later. It, there was a conference. We talking about the proceedings from yesterday or after you had uh, told us we recessed Mr. for Brooks. The, I'm referring to after you call recess for the night yesterday. That's what I'm referring to. Those I, was, documents, I was put in the holding cell for over an hour because they said it was some paperwork that needed to that be. That is correct, sir. You were kept there in order for my clerk, who had to finalize 76 verdicts, two each, one not guilty, one guilty, and provide those to the parties. 
Um, is that and so the, that's why you were kept there, so those could be handed to you. My understanding is they were. I would need a bailiff to confirm for me whether he took those back to his cell or if they were put on his desk because he left them um, in the holding cell. Left them in what holding cell? In here? I have to look through his paperwork to see if they're on here. What holding cell are you referring to, Your Honor? Behind the door. I, I didn't leave anything in that holding cell. I was just trying to figure out why I was in there so long. Are those the verdicts? Yeah. All right, he has those. On. Thank you. Is this the paperwork that was just put on my, it was the paperwork on uh, the desk when I came in that was on top of my folders? Mr. Brooks, I know that they were, you were given the opportunity to take them to your cell because that is what I was advised. Whether you did that or not, I don't know. That's but they not are I'm, also on your desk now. I accept for value in turn for value any documents. We did discuss all of the jury instructions and the verdicts yesterday. So what was discussed when I was in the cell for over there an hour? There was no discussion, sir. The court was in recess. Madam Clerk was simply finalizing the paperwork <coughs> based upon the discussion that was held on the record in open court yesterday. I was told that I had to stay there uh, per you. Yes, so that we could provide them to you and you would have an opportunity to take them back to your cell. But can they, you can they have been them? delivered to the jail? All right. Um, I don't believe there's any other preliminary issues there we are. need to address other than an advisement I will have for Mr. Brooks. But let me turn to the parties and ask if there's anything preliminary to uh, this phase of the trial, which is the jury instructions, the verdicts, um, and closing arguments from the state. No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Anything else from you, sir? Yes, there is. Um, yesterday, I uh, stressed to the court numerous times about me not understanding the proceedings um, and essentially how uh, decisions are being made on my behalf without my understanding or giving consent. The court made various rulings yesterday. I made findings and ultimately made some determinations. I stand behind the record that was made. I'm not going to explain it further. So a lot of those decisions were made when I was not present in the courtroom. I was in the other courtroom, correct? That's true, sir. Is that correct? Um, the record will indicate when those were made and where you were. I can't, um, I can't see the record, though. How, how am I supposed to know what the record will reflect? <coughs> sir, the decisions were made yesterday. I'm not revisiting them today. They need to be revisited, and they, it also needs to be talked about uh, subject matter jurisdiction that has yet to be proven for the record. I'm still trying to understand, Your Honor, how um, you made a, a, a judicial determination on my behalf, which I did not give consent to, to, as you say, I forfeited my right to testify, which I never did. I never said I wanted to. I never said I didn't want to. But that decision was made for me. Also, the decision, the decision for the defense to rest its case was made for me, which I did not consent to, nor did I say I was ready to rest, or nor did I say I did was re ready to rest. I'm trying to understand how all these decisions are being made with, without my consent, without me waiving any rights. I'm, I'm not understanding how, because none of my answers were unresponsive. I just didn't answer the way that your honor wanted me to answer but i stressed yesterday if i don't understand something how am i supposed to answer a question that i don't under, understand fundamentally it's not it's not me saying yes or no and it's not me saying okay i want to waive this or that right and i'm not i'm not trying to make an argument with you in any way i'm just seeking to understand how these decisions are made, if I'm letting the court know and I'm putting the court on notice, hey, I don't understand this or I don't understand that. Any other things? Otherwise, I'm prepared to address each one of those. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, mention, a mention of um, if there is a conviction in this matter, there is a mention of um, sentencing, which I'm assuming there will be a some type of um, um, people may want to speak. I know if there is a conviction on my half, people would definitely want to 
uh, address address the court. Um, there'll be a lot of affairs that need to be put in order, it, obviously on my side. If it pleases the court, if there is a conviction in this matter, I would like the uh, the sentencing to to not be so quick. I'm, I'm asking if it pleases the court for the sentencing to be held off into a later time, not shut up a day or two or a week just so that affairs can be put in order properly and so that the people that want to come in and, and speak will have the opportunity to address the court. I think if that's that a fair pleases, request, sir. If that pleases. I think that's uh, a fair request. I thought about that and some more overnight that it, in the event there is a conviction that um, I would like to give the parties an opportunity to do that. I have no idea how many people would want to speak. My inclination would be, again, and I'm, this is not set in stone. If there is a conviction um, on any of these counts, I may ask the parties to just come back in on Monday, October 31st with uh, kind of a proposed plan of how many people do you think will speak on your behalf? How long do you think it will take? Um, so that I can look at my calendar and then uh, set aside the appropriate amount of time. I certainly don't want to rush anything. And I think that's a fair request that you're making. Thank you. All right. Um, so with all of that then, sir, subject matter <coughs> jurisdiction, I decline to address that further. I stand by the written decision um, that I've made previously. Um, as far <coughs> as the rulings made yesterday regarding uh, your ability or inability to present further testimony and witnesses and to testify yourself, the court did make various rulings and findings that you had forfeited your right to do so by conduct. I'm not going to further explain the law or these prior rulings to you. I stand behind them and I believe I made a very, very clear record. Um, so to the extent that you are asking me to reconsider any of that, uh, that's how I would interpret your statements here today. I decline to do so. So Your Honor, would that be, um, that's still not I have no understanding to um, why I wasn't given the opportunity to place certain things into evidence. I, I have virtually nothing, nothing, zero evidence that I was able to place into evidence, nothing. I disagree with that, sir. You called, I think, nine witnesses on your behalf um, on various issues, including uh, the honking of the horn, the window tinting. You cross-examine many of the state's witnesses about police barricades and the presence of police. So you did I'm, present evidence. I'm speaking to the terms of everything that um, Your Honor asked me to do. You told me to uh, put everything that um, I needed to present to the course in writing. You, you made that ruling. You told me that's what I needed to do. I did that. Um, I Mr. Brooks, you may have interpreted that. I did not require you to do that as far as evidence in the case. I very expressly told you there are rules of procedure and rules of evidence that govern exhibits, <clears throat> testimony, witnesses, etc. What I told you is that any requests that you have related to the case, if it's a motion, be put in writing. I specifically referenced the statute. 80201 regarding how a motion is made and what it should contain, meaning it has a very express uh, request for relief and states the law and the facts upon which the request is being made. Um, again, I'm not going to revisit the prior rulings. Um, I stand behind them and to the extent that the record does not have uh, meaning the record before the jury and the evidence does not have certain pieces of information, evidence or testimony that you uh, wanted to present, um, you forfeited that opportunity <coughs> yesterday based upon your conduct. How did I forfeit the opportunity? Again, I'm not going to revisit that. So what I, I will forfeit, tell you is this. How did I forfeit this the jury opportunity is here. to be able to place into evidence? Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to debate this further. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to debate. I'm trying to understand. To respect the fact that I've made rulings. Your Honor, that's that's you it's made a judicial determination. It's not my job to explain them you made to it, you. I'm not asking you to explain anything. 
You're misinterpreting what I'm trying to ask you and trying to tell you. You're misinterpreting it. With all due respect, Your Honor. I, when you tell me this is what you need to do, I'm going to take it by what you're telling me that I need to do. If I needed to make anything request-wise or anything that I needed to present to the court, it has to be in writing. You told me to do that. I did it. You also brought up when I asked numerous times before, before when would I have a chance to present things into evidence, you told me we were not at the evidentiary phase of the trial yet. So I took that as saying, okay, well, at some point I will have the opportunity to place things in the evidence that need to be put in evidence for the record. So I, I'm not understanding how a decision can be made for me to actually forfeit being able to put things into the record that need to be placed into the record. All these things are, are, are things that, quite frankly, allow me to put on a defense. Uh, things that need to be known, things that should be in the record as far as filings, as far as uh, 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 ICFs that I was told to by you to address certain ICFs either to you or to the clerk of courts, which I did and received copies for all of them except until last week. It was a few of them that I didn't receive copies for that I'm still wondering why I haven't received those copies when I received the copies of all the ones before that. But in, in, in terms of that, I did what Your Honor asked me to do. And these are things that were part of my defense that needed to be placed into the record. So where my confusion comes in is not being able to place those things into the record. Things Mr. that, Brooks, things that you clearly help my defense. I stand by my ruling. I'm not revisiting it. To the extent that you claim lack of understanding or your lack of consent, it's been made abundantly clear on this record, your position on that. I'm not revisiting it. I'm further advising you that when this jury comes out, I expect that you will honor the decisions that were made, not agree, but you will honor them and not interrupt the court or these proceedings as I instruct the jury. So how am I supposed to put these things in the record that need to be in the Mr. record? Mr. Brooks, I'm well aware of the effect my ruling had, and I'm not going to debate it with you further. I'm ju I just want to know how am I supposed to get these things on the record? How am I supposed to? Because the filings that I gave, you actually filed and gave me the copies back. So are those in the record? Mr. Brooks, I'm, I'm just, no longer I'm going just seeking to talk to understand. about this. I'm just seeking to understand. Mr. Brooks, I cannot explain procedure or evidence. The filings that or I filed. I'm asking the law a question, Your question, Your Honor. To you. I'm merely asking a question. The filings that I presented to Your Honor. Any filings with for the this court. court are in the court record. That does not mean they're evidence, sir. And I've told you That's that. That's not previously. what I'm asking. I'm asking are the filings part of the record? The filings that were filed in time stamp that were notarized that I presented to the court, all the filings, the appearance bonds, the, the statement of particulars, the, the notice of special appearance, the, the, uh, the, the court docket sheet, your oath of office, everything that I tried to present into the record, how am I not able to make them part of the record? So they were filed because you, you presented them to the court during the course of this case. Anything that was not offered as an exhibit and received during the evidentiary phase is not evidence in this trial. That's what I attempted to do, and you told me that I couldn't. You told Mr. me, Mr. Brooks, I am bringing this jury Your Honor, out. Listen with all to respect, me. you told me that we were not at the evidence. When I said I have uh, exhibits as well, I have stuff that I want to put into the record. I even asked. I said, Mr. Brooks, may I give an off an offer into evidence? I'm these, going to stop you things. once again. I'm not going to have this discussion and debate. The evidentiary phase of this trial is closed. It should not be, though, Your jury. Honor. I understand your lack of consent, your objection so when would I is be able noted to put, for the when record. When would I be able to put vital information into the record, which I haven't had the opportunity to that do? That opportunity has closed for you, sir. So so you're saying basically you're, prejudice, you're prejudicing my defense by me not being able to present things into evidence offering to evidence 
filings and important paperwork and documents. Mr. Brooks, and you How forfeited your right to do that by your conduct yesterday, and I stand behind that decision. The, I asked, I'm going I asked to do before the yesterday, sir. Your Honor. I'm going I to asked do the this following. before yesterday. You have not honored my request to you that you cease debating me on prior rulings I'm not trying to debate. I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand why my due process is being violated. Mr. Brooks, the record speaks for itself. No, the record does not. I am going to take it, it a five-minute recess. When I come back out, the jury will also be coming out. I'm advising you there will be no, there will be no multiple opportunities where I uh, give you to conform your conduct to the rules of decorum well, then, and courtesy. Well, then just hold me in contempt you, then, Your Honor. You are hold hereby advised. Hold me in contempt because I didn't even, I'm trying to seek to understand. If you start talking about subject matter jurisdiction or any of these other it issues. It needs to be addressed, or Your Honor. in any way We're not talking about subject matter jurisdiction. We're talking about why my, why my due process I has been violated. I will excuse the jury and you will be removed Honor, to the other courtroom. We're talking about the 14th Amendment. Section right. I'm one. taking a five minute break. We are Your Honor, I don't when agree I to a stop. I don't agree to a stop. Your Honor, as a subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor, it has yet to be proven for the record. And upon your refusal, that would be looked at as dishonor. I'm not addressing it. The jury's coming out. So, this is that a, a, a tacit agreement? that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant, Your Honor. Therefore, being that's dishonor. Are you Mr. gonna Brooks, honor your oath of office? Stand. I'm not addressing it further. Are you gonna honor your oath of office? All rise. So I'll take that as a tacit agreement that you're not gonna honor your All oath right, of I'm office. All right, I'm gonna have to excuse the jury. Mr. Brooks, I warned you that if you made any interruptions when they came out, you would be removed to the courtroom. That's what I'm doing right now. You're forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom unless you can promise me right now you'll respect the prior rulings of this court and not interrupt this next phase of the trial, which is the court reading the jury instructions without interruption from you. Can have, you do that? Have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? Mr. Brooks, I very expressly warned you. Have I acted in dishonor? You have disobeyed a direct order from this court. Have I acted in dishonor? You have disrupted these proceedings. I have not disrupted these proceedings. Sir, can you dishonor. pledge to me that when this jury comes back out, that you will remain silent and not reference things like subject matter jurisdiction, the court's oath of office, tacit agreements, or anything? Can you pledge that you will respect these proceedings and this jury by not interrupting? Have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? I will ask you one more time. Can you pledge to be quiet, sir? Why should I why should I have to make a pledge, Your Honor? Have I acted in dishonor? Because under Illinois versus Allen, I believe you've already forfeited your right to be here, but you can reclaim that as soon as you are willing to conduct yourself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in these proceedings, which at this point in the proceedings, sir, all I am doing is reading through the final jury instructions. And I do not want that process interrupted by statements by you that are frankly misstatements of the law. If they're misstatements of the law, Your Honor, how come they haven't been proven for the record? And I'm asking, have right, I acted in dishonor? He refuses to answer the questions. Have I, acted in dishonor, I have given him an ample opportunity to do so. He has forfeited his right to be present for the reading of the jury instructions, and he is to be removed to the neighboring courtroom. We will be in recess until that takes place. Your Honor, have, Thank I, you. have I acted in dishonor? Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks has been placed in the other courtroom. He is presently on mute so that I can make a record. I do need to confirm that the audio and visual um, equipment and system is working. I am getting a thumbs up from uh, the bailiff. I'll just ask Madam Clerk to confirm with the clerk that's over there as well. I would note Mr. Brooks has the headphones on. Um, this court certainly doesn't take pleasure in removing Mr. Brooks from this courtroom once again. We are at an important stage of this proceeding where the court needs to instruct the jury concerning all of the law that will guide them in their deliberations. Um, as I've put on the record previously, the total pages um, 
comes to 107. I will be reading this morning through page 73 prior to the parties given the opportunity to make closing arguments and then reading from pages 74 to 106 um, following that. It is very important that the court do this without interruption. Uh, yesterday, this court held a jury instruction conference uh, where both parties had a full and fair opportunity to raise objections regarding any of the proposed jury instructions, to make requests regarding inclusion of any jury instructions that the court did not include, um, as well as review all of the verdict forms. There's absolutely no reason for there to be an interruption or an objection to this process at this time. The court spent the better part of 25 minutes this morning um, with Mr. Brooks raising issues and prior rulings that this court has spent uh, an abundant amount of time on, including subject matter jurisdiction. He continues to claim he did not consent. That's been noted for the record. He continues to claim that he has uh, a limited or no understanding of prior rulings and decisions of this court. Um, I repeatedly advised him I would not be revisiting these issues, that I wanted to go forward with the jury instructions, and repeatedly warned him that any interruption once the jury came out would result in his removal from the courtroom. Again, I take no pleasure in doing that. I prefer that he be here, but frankly, the decision I made here today with the speed at which I made the decision here today is not only to preserve the dignity of these proceedings, but to do so in a way that avoided the court admonishing Mr. Brooks in front of the jury. This, of course, comes on the history in this case with the repeated removals that this court has had to undertake with Mr. Brooks given his conduct and his behavior in this case. I am currently being advised that he would like to come back. That, of course, is always uh, something that I will give him. As soon as I make my full findings, I will pause, and he will be brought back into this courtroom um, so that he can be in attendance when the jury is brought out. Um, of course, my decision that I made this morning to remove him is based on the authority uh, from Illinois versus Allen. Um, I'd also note that State versus Anthony talks about the Allen decision along with State versus Vaughn. Those are two state court decisions. Um, clearly, even though Mr. Brooks was using a mild-mannered tone of voice, he directly disobeyed the court order that he not interrupt once the jury was brought out. He did that immediately upon the first juror walking in. I believe only a few of the jurors even walked in. He was continuing to talk. I immediately removed them from the courtroom to minimize the impact of his disruption. It was clearly disruptive, uh, but again, he is asking to come back, and I will honor that request. I will further advise him, though, that should he interrupt during the jury instruction um, phase of this trial, by either objecting or raising issues uh, that have no bearing on the advisement to the jury by this court of all of the jury instructions, I will uh, consider admonishing him in the presence of the jury or simply removing the jury so that then I can admonish him and then making the appropriate record. All right, with that, since he's asking to come back, we will Take a pause, we'll recess, we'll come back in when he is set up in this courtroom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. I'll have the jury brought out then. Record so, to reflect, we are all back in this courtroom. Before the jury's brought out, can we address subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor? Before Absolutely the jury's not. brought out? Absolutely not. Is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer those questions as a public servant, Your Honor? So are you going to act in this Mr. Brooks? Are you going to act I've in dishonor? I've already addressed your request. It hasn't been proven for the record, Your Honor. It the jury be. is on its way. They're not out yet, though. But yeah. they're on the way. You held me in contempt. I'm not you held addressing me in contempt these matters, before, sir. 
have I have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? You held me in contempt without me being in dishonor. How how have I dishonored the court? Have I acted in dishonor? Have I rose my voice or argued with Your Honor? Have I disrupted the courtroom Mr. Brooks, in any way? you're back in this courtroom at your request. The jury is coming. I never should have Please been. Please be respectful of their time. And I have. I have been. They weren't even the out before. of the proceedings. They weren't even out before when I was trying to address what needed to be Mr. addressed Brooks, before they came out. Have I, am I acting in dishonor? Proceedings. Am I acting in dishonor? You need to shut the fuck up. Up. So that's a tacit agreement that you don't. Jury, it's a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer questions as a public servant. Right? All right, the jury. No, no jury's out, Mr. Brooks. No jury's out. I was trying to address Brooks, this before they, are they right came outside out. this door. I am not going to do this with you this morning. You either I'm abide doing, by these rules am I and stay in quiet, am or I you will be in, in the other honor? courtroom. Am I acting in dishonor? Yes, you are acting How? in dishonor. How? You are disobeying the direct order of this court to respect the decorum and the dignity of these proceedings, you are merely attempting to delay. I don't care what you think, that's not accurate. Mr. Brooks, I am having this jury out. And, and if you and say making, one word when that door opens, you're making a tacit agreement. Then you will forfeit your right to be present. So you're acting in dishonor, then, Your Honor. All right, the jury may come in. You're acting in dishonor by making a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant. You're not holding up to your oath to protect the All Constitution. All right, the door is open and he's talking. Okay, so you're going to hold me in contempt? Right. The jury cannot come in. Never mind. Are you going to hold All me right. in contempt? The Mr. Brooks is going to be removed. <coughs> We're in recess until that. How, am I, how am I acting in dishonor? Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Can I? We are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. The record to reflect that Mr. Brooks is now in the other courtroom. I currently have him muted so that I can add to the record. Um, I have confirmed he can hear and see as well. I would note he does have the headphones on uh, while in that courtroom. He just lifted them up as well, or at least part of them. Um, this court has previously relied upon uh, the U.S. Supreme Court case of Illinois versus Allen, uh, wherein the United States Supreme Court indicated it is essential to the proper administration of the criminal ju of criminal justice that dignity, order, and decorum be the hallmarks of all court proceedings in our country. The flagrant disregard in the courtroom of elementary standards of proper conduct should not and cannot be tolerated. We believe trial judges confronted with disruptive, contemptuous, stubbornly defiant defendants must be given sufficient discretion to meet the circumstances of each case. No one formula for maintaining the appropriate courtroom atmosphere will be best in all situations. We think there are at least, at least three constitutionally permissible ways for a trial judge to handle such a defendant, including one, bind and gag him, thereby keeping him present, two, cite him for contempt, or three, take him out of the courtroom until he promises to conduct himself properly. I understand Mr. Brooks is waving to the court. I'll address that momentarily. Uh, but the bottom line is there is a history of repeated disruptive behavior by Mr. Brooks. I warned him after he came back in, the first thing he wanted to do was address subject matter jurisdiction. Um, that is, from my perspective, um, simply a tactic on his part to delay these proceedings, to disrupt these proceedings. Um, I've, written a written, I've issued a written decision. He has yet to appeal that written decision. He has that right to file an interlocutory appeal. I would also note at no time during this case has jurisdiction ever been challenged uh, when he was represented by an attorney. Um, so I warned him. Um, given the importance of the proceedings and the need for the court to advise this jury without interruption, he was removed once again. I will not bring him back into this courtroom unless he is willing and pledges to conform his conduct and pledge to not interrupt by making any statements when this jury is present and during the court reading all of the jury instructions. I will unmute him so that he can indicate what he would like to say to the court. You are unmuted, sir. Go ahead. Can, can y'all hear me? We can. 
First of all, at 925, I would uh, like the record to reflect that the prosecution was making uh, dispirited remarks and uh, gestures in pursuant to what just happened. I don't appreciate it, and I think that that is very disrespectful for the record. And again, I'm trying to figure out how did I act in dishonor to be removed from the courtroom? How have I acted in dishonor? This is a whole nother, how have I acted in dishonor? All right, I'm going to mute Mr. Brooks. I'm not going to answer that question. I've made my ruling as far as anything that was done by the prosecution. I was not in the courtroom. Um, the jury was not present. Whatever happened, if anything at all, uh, was done outside the presence of the jury. Um, if there is anything the state wants to put on the record right now, I'll give you that opportunity. Otherwise, um, I am going to bring the jury out, Mr. Brooks. Um, if you want to come back into this courtroom, you need to write your request down on a piece of paper, and when you do that, pledge to this court that you will not interrupt these proceedings. Without that, um, I will not uh, bring you back into this courtroom. Um, anything the state wants to put on the record. I have a question, Your Honor. I don't have anything directly in response to Mr. Brooks' last statement. All right, go ahead. Yesterday afternoon when we had the four screen up, there was a wider view of the courtroom so that the jury box could be seen. Is that possible to do again? Yes, it is. We can take the witness stand camera and pull it out so that he has a view of the jury box as well. I can't angle it, but I can. Yeah. Um, do that and he and for the record when you do that then he can see the jury box so I would ask that that be done before right. we Ma uh, please do that madam clerk court TV see him too and I thought we weren't supposed to show the jury that's why I zoomed it back in well the but they don't have it's not on zoom <laughs> and so the court TV yeah. would be able to fix the camera on me and not on the screen uh, so that they don't capture any of the jurors and they're directed to honor that and do that. Same, same thing obviously with our still photographer. Um, if there are any images captured of Mr. Brooks, um, as you can see the cameras being zoomed out, um, you would need to avoid capturing uh, members of the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. The record should reflect you have zoomed out the camera and it looks right. like about 90% of the jury box can now be seen in the view if Mr. Brooks chooses to right. do that. Mr. Brooks, I'll unmute. What is it you would like the court to address? How can, uh, how can um, you, you rule that I don't have the, the right to be present in the, the courtroom? All right. I've answered that previously. I've made my findings under Illinois versus Allen. Um, he continues to interrupt, even if it is by asking questions. Um, I've made my ruling. The record stands, it speaks for itself, um, and I intend to have the jury brought out. I need one moment um, before I do that, uh, and so I'm going to just take about a two minute recess. All right, we are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before at 9.45. Mr. Brooks sent a note that says, under Illinois v. Allen, I request for the second to be present at my trial. I never consented to not being present, nor did I act in dishonor because he has not made a pledge to conform his conduct as is required under Illinois versus Allen. Um, he has not reclaimed his right to be present and we will continue with him in the other room. I will also make a finding today and I didn't do this previously, although he's forfeited his right to be present given the technology, the audio and visual equipment that we have, the fact that we've also backed out the one camera so he can see the jurors. I'll make a finding, even without that though, that it's the functional equivalent of being present in this courtroom. All right, with that, then the, jur the jury uh, will be brought out. I'll remind Mr. Brooks, uh, while he can reclaim the right to come back into the courtroom and make a request, I am going to be adamant uh, that his request uh, include a statement that he's willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concept of courts and judicial proceedings and specifically uh, pledge to not interrupt the reading of the jury instructions. Until such time, he will remain in that courtroom. Okay, okay. All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right. 
I'll rise for the jury. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Members of the jury, the court will now instruct you upon the principles of law which you are to follow in considering the evidence and in reaching your verdict. It is your duty to follow all of these instructions. Regardless of any opinion you may have about what the law is or ought to be, you must base your verdict on the law. If you find the defendant guilty of count 42, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? I've read 41 pages thus far. I am going to take a short comfort break and uh, we'll come back in about 10, 15 minutes. This will also give the jurors and the parties a chance to have a comfort break as well. All rise for the jury. A.M., um, but I will address that when I get back on the record. We are in recess. All right, we are back on the record. Um, the jury has not been brought out just yet. I indicated I would address um, a note that was passed by Mr. Brooks to the court. Um, in it, he indicates the following, I have reclaimed my rights, parenthesis, that I never gave up or consented to give up, parenthesis, to be present, and you have not honored your oath of office to protect my constitutional rights, specifically my 14th Amendment, Section 1, which references equal protection of the laws. <coughs> would you like to explain this on the record, or should I? I will if you won't. I would like to make an offer of proof for my appeal on the record. Um, I indicated previously that should Mr. Brooks want to come back into this courtroom pursuant to Illinois versus Allen, he could certainly reclaim the right to be present, but he would need to be willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concept of courts and judicial proceedings. I specifically advise that he would need to pledge to not interrupt the proceedings. Um, he has not done that, meaning he has not indicated he wants to come back or that he will pledge to be courteous and follow the rules of decorum and specifically pledge to not interrupt as I read through the jury instructions. Um, and his letters or notes that he passed uh, will of course be made part of the record, but I'm going to deny his request to make a further record for appeal as I need to continue advising the jury uh, of the jury instructions. So with that, uh, Mr. Brooks will remain where he is at. Um, anything further he wants to address, he will need to do that in writing uh, as he has done with a note, but I don't feel the need to give him any additional opportunity to explain that. Um, what I will ask is, is he going to make a request to come back into this courtroom? And if that is true, he can give me a thumbs up sign and then I will address that. All right, I will unmute him. Mr. Brooks, what is your request as it relates to coming back into this courtroom? I've requested to come back into the courtroom with the first, the first uh, writing that you said I had to write. I put that on the record already, sir. You did not pledge to uh, respect the rules of courtesy and decorum and pledge to not interrupt the court. Are you willing to pledge that at this time? Your Honor, with all due respect, I've never had to do that before to reclaim my right. I've always asked when you've given me the opportunity, when I felt that the time was right, I've always asked to come back, have I not? Mr. I Brooks, given your conduct Taylor. this morning and your blatant violation of my direct order to you to <clears throat> not interrupt when the jury was being brought out, I felt it important to strictly enforce uh, the language of Illinois versus Allen um, and only bring you back if you are willing to conduct yourself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concepts of courts and judicial proceedings and specifically pledge to not interrupt as I uh, go through all of these jury instructions. If you're willing to do that, I will bring you back in. Your Honor, with all due respect, can we at least be fair and say today hasn't been uh, as volatile as other days or as the the back and forth between you and I ha hasn't been uh, what it has been previously? Mr. Brooks, we started the advisement to the jury an hour later than I anticipated, so I would thoroughly disagree with you that it might not have been volatile or, or loud, but it was nonetheless disruptive. So. I will ask Your you Honor. these questions, sir. Are, 
if you come back into this courtroom, are you willing to honor my request and order to you that you not interrupt as I read through the jury instructions? Yeah, I don't understand the, the question that you're asking. Sir, are you willing why? to refrain from raising the issue of subject matter jurisdiction if you come back into this courtroom? Your Honor, with all due respect to your ruling on Illinois versus Allen, that was not part of Illinois versus Allen. I don't understand why that's being Mr. Made Brooks, I'm not going to debate the meaning of Illinois versus uh, Illinois v. Allen with you. I'm simply trying to get you back into this courtroom. You seem to want to be here, but you don't want to pledge to follow the rules of courtesy and decorum. So that's on you. Your, your Honor, this this has never been done before. It's never been done before, and I've always been able to reclaim my right to be able to be present. Are you willing? Which, which is what I stated uh, when I first came over here. I, I've been stating the same thing. I've actually told the bailiff numerous times. Mr. Brooks, I am strictly enforcing the language of Illinois versus Allen, which says the following. I will repeat myself again. Once lost, the right to be present can, of course, be reclaimed as soon as the defendant is willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concept of courts and judicial proceedings. I have uh, not required the pledge previously. I've allowed you to come back, uh, but given the interruptions this morning and your immediate discussion of things like subject matter jurisdiction and my oath the minute one juror walked through that door, I cannot take that uh, I will not bring you back in without that pledge. So where does it say anything about a pledge, Your Honor? Sir, I'm not going to debate the language with you. I am establishing what I believe is a reasonable restriction on your right to come back into this courtroom based upon the history in this case of your repeated violations of the simple rules of courtesy and decorum and your failure to follow my very clear and direct uh, requirement this morning that you not interrupt the um, reading of the jury instructions and you be silent once the jury entered the courtroom. I did that in part because it not only preserves the dignity and decorum of this trial, it also frankly protects your rights and it minimizes your bad behavior in front of the jury. Your Honor, no, I, didn't, I didn't interrupt you while you were talking. I'll let you make your record without talking over you or interrupting you. Thank you. I will I would the, agree with you just now. The way the way that I'm interpreting when you reference to me with the Illinois versus Allen where your ruling is coming from, the way that I interpret that is not the way that you're saying it to me now. That's why I don't understand the, what you're asking. I'm I'm interpreting that in a, in a totally different way. Um, I'd refer you to the third section of Illinois versus Allen where the U.S. Supreme Court was discussing what the trial court did in that case and it said the following, the trial court in this case decided under the circumstances to remove the defendant from the courtroom and to continue his trial in his absence until and unless he promised to conduct himself in a manner befitting an American courtroom. <laughs> As we have said earlier, we find nothing unconstitutional about this procedure. So that is the authority, sir, in addition to the other uh, quotation. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll give you one more opportunity, sir. You can come back into this courtroom, but I do not want you to address or attempt to address subject matter jurisdiction or any of the other rulings that I've previously made. I need to continue with the advisement to this jury about the rules that govern their deliberations. That is the stage we are at. And if you violate that in any way by raising any of those legal issues in their presence, that will be in direct violation of the requirement for you to reclaim your right and you will be removed back to the other courtroom. Did you hear me say that, sir? I'm informed, but Your Honor, now you have to, you have to, you just stated on the record if I, raise these issues in their presence but if they're not in the courtroom it's not in their presence correct sir i can't bring them into the courtroom until you're here i expect you during that short interval not to raise these legal issues that i've already addressed multiple times 
So yes, I'm telling you, if you come back into this courtroom, I don't even want to have you raise any of those issues. I want to bring the jury right out without interruption. That is my clear expectation, whether they are the jury's in the courtroom or not. Your Honor, that's now I'm I'm not I'm confused because you just said don't raise any issues in their presence, and now you're I'm I'm confused. I don't I... because you're indicating to me by your statement that you intend to raise them once you get back into this courtroom. And so I'm making Honor, that another restriction, and you need to pledge to me that you will not do that. Your Honor, the way that I'm interpreting what you just read to me from the other section that you just read from Illinois v. Allen, it does not have that language. So I'm, I'm Mr. Brooks, not I'm not going to debate the language. Do you want to come back in here or not? I've stated, I've stated numerous times that I shouldn't even have been brought over here anyway that I wanted to come back. But now there's being, what I don't understand about it, Your Honor, is that there being, there's being uh, rules in, in, enforced Mr. On Brooks, do you want to, to come, come back. back in here or not? It's a very simple I've question. I said yes already. All right, then I'm going, to say the same thing? because then you go on and make other statements and then I can't because even effectuate your request. But I'm trying. I'm trying to tell you how I'm interpreting what you're saying to me. If, if you want, Mr. Me, Brooks, want I'm going to, to mute informed. you. We're going to go in recess. He can be brought back over. But I will advise you that if you start back in, even outside the presence of this jury, with any of the legal issues I've already ruled on, I'm not. You will go back to the other courtroom. It's that simple. So we'll be in recess. He'll be brought back over, and then we'll start back up. We know what he's doing as they were before. Um, the records reflect that Mr. Brooks remains in the other courtroom despite what I thought was he made clear he wanted to be here. Um, he's, my understanding is he um, is now saying he doesn't understand what this court wants. I've made it very clear, I believe, what this court's expectation is that um, I continue with the jury instructions without interruption that Mr. Brooks follow um, the rules of courtesy and decorum. Um, he's had those for quite some time and that he conduct himself uh, consistently with the dignity and decorum that these proceedings deserve. And that includes not interrupting um, or bringing up legal matters that this court has previously ruled on. Um, we have lost a significant amount of time now addressing, or not even addressing, but Mr. Brooks really interrupting the flow and the proceedings uh, based upon his responses, and then he attempts to engage with this court on the meaning, for example, of Illinois versus Allen. Um, he needs to make a very clear statement to this court, not an ambiguous one, but a very clear one, that he wants to come back into this courtroom and that he's uh, willing to conduct himself appropriately. And until he does that, um, he will continue to forfeit his right to be present in this courtroom as I instruct the jury. So with that, um, I did give him five minutes. I said, you have five minutes to decide. I set a timer. It went off. He is still in the other courtroom. We are going to continue. So the jury is to be brought out. And they can hear us fine. <laughs> and Madam Clerk confirmed that the audio and video is working just fine. I should further indicate he continues to be muted. Uh, so as there are not interruptions. And he, if he wants to address something with the court, he needs to put it, uh, write it on his pad of paper, um, and I will address it at the appropriate time. I just want to put on the record that at 11.01, I took the break. It's now 11.48. So it's, I intended to take 10, 15 minutes tops. And Mr. Brooks, you can write it down. I'm not going to interrupt further. The jury's coming out. All right. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Continuing on then with the jury instructions, if you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 43, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 43. The opinion does not establish the truth of the facts upon which it is not guilty as to count 43. Consider the opinion only if you believe the assumed facts upon which it, upon which it is based did have been proved. Commit the crime of if you find that the facts stated in the hypothetical question have not been proved, then the opinion based on those facts should not be given any weight. 
At this time, I will reserve the instruction on closing arguments because we are going to take our lunch break and then come back after the lunch hour for closing arguments. All rise for the jury. All right, thank you. Be seated. As soon as the doors close, I just need to put a couple things on the record. Um, as I read, the doors close, right? There you go. As I read through the bail jumping, it dawned on me that the battery should not be referenced because the battery was not on Main Street. And so I took it out um, because the way that the charge and the information reads, and we had that discussion preliminarily, which is why later on it doesn't reference the instruction for battery. So I cleaned that up by rereading it and taking that out. So I wanted to make a record of that. Um, obviously, I will need to have uh, a new set made that has that uh, correction. Um, and I apologize for not catching that previously. Um, but obviously, I caught that as I read it. Um, there was one other heading that said preliminary on, I think it was instruction 70. I need to cross that out. Um, and I think I found the word a or a, depending on how you say it, missing from one thing. I'm going to add that in, and I'll, and I'll have that for the parties. And then uh, I did note that at approximately 1219, um, it may have been a little bit earlier than that, but I noticed Mr. Brooks was waving his hands. At one point, I did indicate I would address that at a later point in time. Um, I'm aware, I am aware of a number of filings. Um, I addressed two of them previously, but there are two additional. Um, I am going to have copies made of all of these filings for the state uh, so that they have an opportunity to review them. From my perspective, just briefly, um, he is making some objections to what I am doing, but at no time in those did he ask uh, to be brought back to the courtroom, and certainly within those, he did not pledge to follow the um, basic tenets of courtesy and decorum. Um, given where I was at in the proceedings with the reading of the preliminary instructions and given the court's prior uh, finding that he had forfeited his right to be present, um, I thought it important to get through the reading of the instructions up until the point of the closing argument instruction, which I reserve because I'll uh, review that with the jury when they come back prior to the parties being given their opportunity to give closing arguments. Um, I will also be advising Mr. Brooks that given that um, I'm moving on to a second part of this, that being the closing arguments, he uh, will be uh, invited back into the courtroom here for those closing arguments, of course, subject to um, his conduct, um, I expect that he will follow the rules of courtesy and decorum um, and also not raise legal issues in front of the jury um, when they are here. With that, um, we will take our lunch recess. Um, it's 1247. I will take an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone. All right, it's 2 o'clock. I'll call the case. State of Wisconsin versus Daryl Brooks, case number 21CF 1848. May have the appearances, please. Good afternoon, Judge Swafford, Leslie Daisy, and Zach Wichell, appearing for the state. <clears throat> I'm here without, without prejudice by special appearance. Um, beneficiary, I'm here under fraud, menace, duress, and extortion. Judiciary, Jennifer R. Girl. This is a social security sesta Q trust action, which you are a real party in interest to. As Sue Juris and Propria, Propria Persona, this is a military admiralty tribunal and maritime law and the title for the United States Code Section 1, which you can see, which states placing a fringe on a national flag is within discretion of presidential president acting as commander in chief of the army and navy. Is this uh, a common law court or an admiralty court? The records reflect that the individual known to this court as Daryl Brooks is present in person in custody. He is wearing a dress shirt 
Um, I know he has a suit coat, but it's not on. He's also wearing a mask. The court is not going to address any of the issues that he is raising as they are meritless. Um, and uh, the, I would also say the same as to the uh, notes that he passed while he was in the other courtroom. Um, for the record, I did provide a copy of all of those to the state as well. They are also uploaded into the file and are made part of the record to the extent that he raises objections or lack of consent and is noted for the record. I was about to do that and say that I don't consent to being called that name or identity. That is the trust name and it is not me myself. I don't recognize that name nor do I consent to being called by that name. With all respect, Your Honor. And we still have yet to address subject matter jurisdiction, which has yet to be proven on the record. May I receive those original copies time stamped? All right, I need to uh, make a record of one part of a jury instruction that I do need to advise the jury. It will also be corrected in the packet. Um, I believe within the last year, the jury instruction on credibility of witnesses was modified by the jury instruction committee and it was just an oversight on the court's part to not include it's really just one paragraph it was read to the jury at the beginning of the case with the preliminary instructions uh, but it is a paragraph regarding implicit bias and so i do think it's important to advise the jury of that i intend to do that when they come out and then again uh, the full <coughs> instruction will be amended so that it's in the packet that goes to the jury. Um, and Madam Clerk, if you haven't already, if you could print off page 72. It's the, um, it adds a paragraph before the last paragraph that starts with there is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony. Um, and again, I wanted to be consistent with the most recent version of the jury instructions and consistent with what was instructed or provided to the jurors uh, at the beginning of the case. And so I will make sure that they have that and so advise them when they come out. Um, also, I will read instruction 160, closing arguments. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could just make the change so that it's of parties. Um, we, we've missed that. Uh, correction as well. So it's the closing arguments of the parties, not the attorneys. And so I will just make that correction and make sure it's. I accept the value and return for value this document. And Your Honor, I requested that I have uh, copies of my filings from earlier, time stamped. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I'll provide you with uh, the copies later on. I need to continue with the instructing of the jury and have the parties make their closing arguments. Your Honor, with all I did, respect, the state received copies. How come I can't receive the copies of my filings? You know what? We'll give, I can give you the print-offs, but I can't give you the originals right now. I, that's what I'm referring to, and you will absolutely get those back. Um, I, I guess I was mistaken that you wrote copy on it. I thought you retained a copy for your records. So with that, Madam Clerk will print off from the record. It won't be the yellow copies just yet. I'll take that up later outside the presence of the jury after the case has been given to them. Now, in terms of the closing arguments, um, I did set a time limit for the parties yesterday. Each side will have a total of one hour. Um, Mr. Brooks, so that you are fully aware, the party with the burden of proof, which is the state of Wisconsin, goes first. Then you, as the opposing party, will have an opportunity to respond and argue. And then time limit willing, the state also has the opportunity to present rebuttal uh, because they have the burden of proof. And that is provided with the um, excerpt from the bench book that was provided to you yesterday. It has uh, the purpose of the closing arguments is to summarize the facts, marshal arguments, focus the issues for the jury. I just talked about the order of the arguments. Um, the scope of the arguments are the content, duration, and form of argument are within the court's discretion. That's why I set a time limit of one hour for the parties. Mr. Brooks, I will advise you that I certainly will wait and see uh, how you present your argument today. I will certainly wait to see if there are any 
um, objections raised, but I also want you to be aware that if I feel the arguments are improper, I may simply without an objection say please move on as a clear indication from this court that um, what you are stating is not proper um, under the various rules and case law that govern um, closing arguments. Again, Your Honor, without prejudice, I'm here by special appearance. I don't consent to being called that name for the record. It's noted, sir. All right. Then with that, I will have the juror. Oh, go ahead. Uh, looks like Attorney Upper has some issues she wants to raise. Yes, I just have one question, Your Honor. Would I have permission to put the easel up and display some of the poster boards? I did confer with uh, Captain Dussault as far as security is concerned, and he agreed to it if the court would give me that uh, authority. Where would it be displayed? He's going to put it, like, right here, and then you want me standing at this table during I the do. Day? Yes. So I would just position it, like, right here. Um, and I don't have to leave it up through the whole thing. I realize it blocks the view of, uh, of people in the courtroom. Detective Casey would be willing to assist me in, in removing them when I'm done with them, if that's okay with you. I trust it won't block Mr. Brooks' view of the jury. And that's as long that, as yeah, that, I was going to put it like right about here so that he could still see me and the jury. With that caveat, yes, I will allow that. All right. Objection. What is that? What is supposed to be put up? They're uh, previously uh, admitted, Your Honor. It's Exhibit 15 and. 130, I believe. So are they exhibits? I'm, I'm confused to what they are. Mr. Brooks, I've made a ruling. Uh, the state has made a request. I've granted it. Yeah, but I'm, In terms I'm saying of, I don't understand what, what's being shown. Should not have the right to ask, uh, to object and ask what it is that's actually going to be shown? The state's put on the record what it is. It's a, it is, they, or I should say, they are exhibits that have previously been received by the court during the course of this trial. That is proper for a party to do that during its closing arguments. So can I put up exhibits? Um, Mr. Brooks, I don't know what you have planned for your closing argument. Uh, so I'm, I'm making a request, the same request. May I be able to put up uh, Well, exhibits? I guess it depends on what it is, sir. So I'm not going to take up any more time because what I intend to do is um, once the state goes through its closing, I may take just a short comfort break depending on how long it is. Um, and if there's something in particular, what are you, you will need to tell me what it is. As long as it's an exhibit from this case, then I don't, I wouldn't have an issue with it. They would be from this case, obviously. It's just not nothing that the state has. I'm not aware of exhibits that the state wouldn't have, that you would have. Everything that's been received, we have a list. Um, so if it's not something that was received during this trial as an exhibit by the court, unless you tell me what it is so that I can make a ruling, um, I, I can't see how it would be relevant or appropriate for your closing argument. They're uh, part of my filings that you filed. The filings have no relevance to the issues that are before the jury. The closing arguments are to direct the jury so that they have your arguments so that when they go back to determine the issues in this case, which are related to whether you're guilty or not guilty of the 76 charges, um, things like subject matter jurisdiction or uh, like that would not be something that would be proper before this jury. Those are legal issues that the court would decide. The jury is the judge of the facts. The court is the judge of the law. That's I'm why not, I have all of these jury instructions to give to the jury. I'm not referring to subject matter jurisdiction. What are you referring to then? Be very specific so I, I can make a finding and rule. I was specific. Uh, my other filings that That's was not filed. specific enough, my, sir. What are you referring my court, to? Dr. Which Sheen, filing? My, let me know when you're done, Your Honor. Which filing, sir? Not generally, but specifically. Are you done? Are you done? Sir, that's very rude and disrespectful. No, I'm just, I didn't know if you was going to say something. I that's why I'm asking, are you done? Which? Ex what filing Your Honor, are how you come every to? time I try, even when I try to err on the side of caution, you, you find some <laughs> way to make it to be something that it's not? 
I didn't know if you was going to say something else. I've asked a question, sir. So when I do that, I would hope it would convey to you I'm looking for an answer. So which filing are you referring to? All my filings, all my filings, my my uh, my notice of appearance, my statement of particulars, my bond, the court docket sheet, all of those filings. The request to display those to the jury is denied. It's not relevant. How is it not relevant? Not even your That's oath of office? That's my determination, sir. So I'll take, I am going to start this. Not even your oath of office can be shown? No, that is not relevant to these proceedings, sir. It is. It's not relevant in front of the jury. Why is it not relevant? Can you? Mr. Brooks. Can you explain you why that's not relevant? You are not going to be able to raise those types of issues and present a closing argument based upon my oath of office, whether I'm licensed to practice law in the state of Wisconsin. I said your uh, oath of office. I didn't say anything. Whether you consent to this appearance or not, none of those things help the jury determine the issues in this case, which are related to whether you are guilty or not guilty of the 76 charges that have the been jury, the jury filed should in know this that case. They should know the truth in their duties, in their rights. They should know that at least. Mr. Brooks, I'm putting you on notice that if you continue with this um, insistence upon presenting information that's not properly before the jury as evidence in this case, that I will instruct you during your closing argument to move on and potentially ask the jury, have the jury leave so that I can admonish you. And if you keep insisting on that, sir, that will be a, in direct violation of the court's direction. So to they you. can't even, they can't even know that I got a shock device on my ankles. They absolutely do not need to know that. Why so it's not? not relevant to the determinations of guilt or innocence in this it's case. It's the truth. Mr. Brooks, your custodial status is not on trial here. Uh, I would no, argue that it is. conduct from November 21st of 2021 is That hasn't been trial. proven. You may not bring up your, the way that you've been shackled. It's not relevant, sir. It's and if you truth. do so, you do it at your peril. But it's, here's there, the there thing, is the no jury peril. is specific. It's my right, no, though. Let me, let me go. Okay. It's my constitutional is, right. Just like under the First Amendment, which I preserved the, my First Amendment right when I came in this morning, I also preserved my right. Sixth Brooks, Amendment right. Please stop. You do not have an unfettered First Amendment right. That is very clear based upon. What do you all mean by unfettered? Law. What do you mean by unfettered? It I don't. Means it is not absolute. It can be restricted. So the Constitution of the United States can be constricted. Can you say one more dumb thing. I'm going to say a lot of dumb things. <laughs> all right. Mr. Brooks, I'm putting you on notice that if you continue with your insistence on raising issues that are- I'm going to raise issues that the jury needs to are, know. They're not Regardless, issues. because they're, they're, they're under the rights of the United States Constitution, Mr. which Brooks, is the law I'm of the land. I'm going to your attention to closing instruction 460. I'm going, I'm going to, to let the jury point. know the truth, their, their duty and their rights. Under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment, I have the right to inform them of their rights, of the truth, and of their duties under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of these United States. You can't, no state law can override that. Mr. Any Brooks, law, you intend any to law keep this up when the jury comes out? Your because Honor, I need to no, have I do the not. State That's why I'm addressing this before, they're, before they come out. That's why I'm trying to address this before they come out. So it doesn't become an issue once they're in here. But under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, which are rights that I preserved the moment we stepped in here this morning when this proceedings started. I preserved those rights for the record. And now you're telling me that those rights are not, would you say, unfettered? or I don't know what you say. I don't even know what that means. I don't even understand that. But any law repugnant of the United States Constitution is null and in void. Mr. Brooks, I'm putting you on notice that you can also uh, forfeit by your conduct the right to present a closing argument. In appropriate circumstances, um, the right to present a closing argument, no different than the right to testify, may be subject to forfeiture where your conduct is incompatible with the assertion of the right at issue. The goals that this court has attempted 
to follow throughout this proceeding are multifaceted and multifold. Uh, number one, I do have an obligation and I have done my best to ensure that this is a fair trial. However, a fair trial does not mean a defendant has unfettered rights to state whatever he wants, when he wants. Uh, this court, not only through the course of the trial, uh, is deemed with the responsibility to control the presentation of evidence to as to ensure fairness and reliability of the criminal trial process. Um, it also includes uh, ensuring that the closing arguments are relevant, are appropriate. Um, this court must also uh, be concerned with efficiency and effectiveness and, of course, last but not least, courtesy and decorum in this courtroom, what I would generally refer to as civility in the courtroom. Um, you do not have unfettered First Amendment rights or an unfettered Sixth Amendment right, sir. Um, you must conform your conduct to the rules of decorum, the rules of evidence, and the rules of procedure. While you have a right to present relevant and probative arguments to this jury, uh, you may not, and you may not present arguments related to such things as jury nullification, subject matter jurisdiction, the court's oath or lack thereof, if that's what you believe, whether this court is a court of common law, admiralty, all of those things relate to your claim as being a sovereign, which are frankly baseless, they're meritless, they've been debunked by many courts, including the court uh, in the Benneby decision that's been referenced by this court previously. I will give you a fair opportunity to present a closing argument, but again, it is not unfettered. The simple fact is, sir, this court can restrict your right to present a closing argument. This court has the authority under 90611, <clears throat> under the various cases, uh, including Illinois versus Allen, including Rock versus Arkansas, although Rock versus Arkansas and uh, Chambers versus Mississippi dealt with the right to testify. Um, there is a decision, uh, I looked it up earlier, and I'll just pull it up and tell you the case site so that, we, so that you have it. I would direct your attention to Herring versus New York, found at 422 U.S. 853, a 1975 case, although in a footnote, it Herring, does stand Herring for the proposition that a defendant who has exercised the right to conduct his own defense has, of course, the same right to make a closing argument. That's quoting State uh, Ferretta versus California, or following the same logic from uh, Rock and Anthony and Chambers, uh, a right even a constitutional right that a defendant has uh, may be forfeited by conduct. This court, uh, just like it attempted to do with regard to your right to testify and set up reasonable restrictions so as to uh, meet all of the goals that the court needs to meet, um, are as, will be as follows, and that is, again, sir, you may not bring up um, matters that are not relevant to the determination of guilt or innocence. That means evidence that was not presented and not received in this courtroom is not relevant to your closing arguments. Um, it's not, uh, the arguments must be based on the law, not as you interpret the law, but as the law is. You must base your closing arguments on the facts that have been established during this case, meaning the evidence, the testimony. Um, as I indicated earlier, the, the purpose of a closing argument is to summarize the facts, marshal arguments, and focus the issues for the jury. It is fair that you comment on evidence, including arguing evidence to the conclusion or inference. Um, it is your ability or your opportunity to convince the jury that you are not guilty of these offenses. Um, you may not convey any idea that you have undisclosed information. Neither party may vouch for a witness or otherwise express personal belief or opinion regarding truth or falsity of any testimony or evidence. It, is, it would be improper to ask a jury to draw inferences that the parties know are not true and your 
comments on evidence is limited to evidence in the case. You may not comment on facts outside the record or peculiarly within your own knowledge. And, and that is just some of the guidelines for determining the proprietary of arguments that I am guided by from my judicial bench book and all of the cases that are referenced therein. So you are put on notice, sir, that even without an objection, this court may, in an effort to preserve the dignity, the decorum, and to keep the issues properly before the jury, may advise you during your closing argument to move on. If you do not honor the court's rulings, then you will run the risk of forfeiting your right to be present and potentially forfeiting your right to further present your closing argument. With that, I am bringing this jury out to complete the instructions that I need to complete to add to the credibility uh, instruction, the paragraph on implicit bias, and to let them know the full instructions that they receive will have it, to read 160 closing arguments of the parties, and then to have the state go first as they bear the burden of proof. Now, Your Honor, I'll just let you make your record. I didn't overtalk you. I didn't interrupt you. Is that fair to say? I'll let you, I'll let you make the record. Shut up! With all due respect, when, when, when will I be able to make the record? As I've tried to do numerous times by saying I, off, I wanted to present an offer of proof for my appeal. That's the chance for me to be able to make the record. I'm denying your request to make an offer of proof regarding your appeal. It's sir, not, I'm, I'm not, not allowed to make the to record at all, Your Honor. Sir. I'm not allowed sir. to make the record at all. As I just let you did, because some some of the sir, issues I has have, been, some of the issues has been. You have told me what you want to do. I told Honor. you you can't. I've addressed your request. Honor, some of the issues have been me over talking you and interrupting you. I did not do that. Even though everything that you said, you have not proven for the record, and this is unlawful law. You haven't shown one time that that's that is lawful for you to do what you been doing Mr. as far Price, as your rulings. Once again, I'm not going to debate with you the prior rulings of this court. There's absolutely no need at this point for you to your make Honor, an offer of proof regarding my prior rulings or decisions that you disagree with. Hold me in contempt. I have, I have constitutional rights that are being trampled on and you're coming up with ways to make a lawful law where it doesn't say in Illinois versus Allen anywhere about utilizing the, the mute button. reflect that the jury bailiff is in here. However, the jury is still in the hallway. Yeah. I'm going to give Mr. Brooks one more opportunity to be respectful of the court's rulings, whether Your he Honor, agrees with them I or not. I haven't dishonored the court. I'm, I'm merely exercising my rights under the Constitution, under the First Amendment, and under the Sixth Amendment. Mr. Brooks, your rights do not include you disrupting these proceedings not, the way I'm that you have through the, the course proceeding. of You just told weeks. me you don't have to honor my constitutional rights in so many words. You're using a mute button that's Brooks, not even in your decision. Mr. Brooks, the jury is outside this door. They're not brought in I'm yet. Informed that I'm, the jury, asking I'm informed you that the jury is outside the door. To be respectful of their time. They're not in the courtroom. I'm They're not present. I'm asking you to be respectful of the court's ruling. They're not present. With these are issues not. that need to be resolved before they are present. Mr. Brooks, they will not be resolved to your satisfaction. It's not about my satisfaction. It's about the Constitution. Made. It's about what's right. Are you going to Are you going to answer questions as a public right. servant or while you're making up laws that are not in, in the uh, Illinois versus Allen and never utilized right, the, the mute button and never said anything jury. about a mute Thank button. You. It is clear Why that Mr. Brooks being has muted? absolutely no intention of following the simple rules of decorum and courtesy. He has repeatedly talked over me. He's repeatedly interrupted. Even though I've made rulings, he's not respectful of the fact that I made a ruling even though he disagrees with it. How can you I attempted it? to bring the jury out How can you and utilize a he mute continued to talk. That's, that's, so, Mr. Brooks, Your you Honor, have forfeited your right to be that, present for the state's is that closing not, argument. Your Honor, you will can be you answer taken this to question? the courtroom next As door, and I will servant, invite you back over when it's time for your you can't, closing argument. You can't arguments. invite me back over. I can reclaim my right. So how can you invite me All to right, do the anything? The courtroom is to be cleared so that Mr. Brooks can be removed to the next courtroom, and I'll make appropriate findings, findings when he's in the other courtroom. Yeah, when I and can you'll do mute so me, without, which you can't lawfully do. Um, interruption. You can't lawfully mute me. So now you're now you're trampling over my first. Shut up! I need it quiet in the courtroom, please. We are back on the record. Um, appearances are as they were before, except that Mr. Brooks has been uh, removed to the other courtroom. Um, the court did that because we came out on the record at two o'clock following the <coughs> lunch break. 
uh, Mr. Brooks was brought to the main courtroom. Um, and during that almost 35 minutes or so, he was insistent on raising a variety of legal issues with which this court has either previously addressed or which are meritless and do not uh, warrant any further response. He is insistent on making a record and an offer of proof. Um, this would not be the appropriate procedural mechanism, meaning an offer of proof at this time. We are not in the midst of a trial where the courts made an evidentiary ruling that would require the preservation of the record by making an offer of proof. Um, this court uh, has been attempting, frankly, all day to get through the reading of jury instructions, to get to the point where the parties make their closing arguments, and ultimately to put this case in the jury's hands. It has been challenging. It has been met uh, by resistance from Mr. Brooks. Um, I would once again describe it as being stubbornly defiant, although at times he may wait for me to uh, make my ruling. He, c he continues to not respect the fact that a ruling has been made, and he wants to argue and re-argue and re-argue points that this court has already gone over. And in an effort to simply put him on notice regarding his behavior, given the history of this case, uh, the court was attempting to set some parameters regarding closing arguments so that they are focused, so that they are proper, um, and that they follow the law. That was met with a considerable amount of resistance and repeated statements by Mr. Brooks that he has um, First Amendment rights, Sixth Amendment rights, Fourteenth Amendment rights. He has all of those rights. That is not in dispute. But those rights do not come in a vacuum when we are in a court uh, proceeding and a trial such as this. Um, the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, the rules of courtesy and decorum all <coughs> apply. And this case has demonstrated that a stubbornly defiant defendant can forfeit even important constitutional rights by conduct. Uh, that includes the right to be present. It included the right to present further witnesses and testimony. And it included the right of the defendant to testify on his own behalf. I hope that I do not have to go through um, a decision that forfeits his right or that makes a finding that he's forfeited his right to make a closing argument. I will certainly uh, wait and see how that goes. I would note he was very respectful when he did his opening statement. Um, it was clear. He made a variety of points. Um, he did so in a way that I would say was very um, conscientious of people's time. It was cogent. It was concise. It was probably about 35 minutes. I may be off a little bit, but that's what my memory is. It wasn't overly lengthy. Um, I would hope that he follows some of those same things here when he does his closing argument. But he has been removed from this courtroom because of his stubborn defiance and disrespect of this court of courtesy and decorum um, and what I truly believe is an effort on his part to continue to delay and lengthen these proceedings. Um, I've said it before, I'll state it again. Um, it is essential to the proper administration of criminal justice that dignity, order, and decorum be the hallmarks of all court proceedings in our country. The flagrant disregard in the courtroom of elementary standards of proper conduct should not and cannot be tolerated. And trial courts and trial judges that are confronted with disruptive, contemptuous, stubbornly defiant defendants must be given sufficient discretion to meet the circumstances of each case. No one formula for maintaining the appropriate courtroom atmosphere will be best in all situations. They noted three constitutionally permissible ways to handle such a stubbornly defiant defendant. Um, but they also indicated that no one formula 
for maintaining the appropriate court atmosphere will be best in all situations. I've noted this before. This is a case from 1970. The technology that we now have in this brand new courtroom was not available then. Um, I have the ability to have Mr. Brooks appear from the other courtroom by way of audio and visual means. We can see him, he can see us. I've confirmed prior to calling the case that the audio was working, that the video is working. Uh, the one camera, there's four cameras in my courtroom, there's four cameras in his courtroom. However, it is set to one camera since he's the only individual there. Um, other than the bailiffs, but I'm talking about as a party to the litigation. So the courtroom, the cameras in my courtroom include one that would normally be on the witness stand that has been zoomed out so as to capture uh, the large majority of the jury box. I even adjusted the camera that's on the state's table so that uh, the exhibit that's currently up uh, to the my left, her right, attorney Opper is uh, viewable uh, in the camera angle, um, and uh, she is still present within, meaning viewable within that as well. Um, and although I've made a finding that he has forfeited his right to be present for the state's closing argument, I'll find that the technology that I have available. Uh, it is the, that his appearance from the other courtroom is the functional equivalent of appearing in this courtroom and being present uh, due to the uh, technology that is available. Um, I do have him on mute for the time being because I needed to make a record and there is a very lengthy history with Mr. Brooks during this case of him talking over me and my inability to make an adequate record if I am in a constant uh, back and forth with him and trying to talk over him. And so I, yes, made the decision to utilize the mute function on the incoming audio. I know he disagrees with my ability to do that, but I believe it is consistent with um, ensuring dignity, order, and decorum uh, that when appropriate, he be muted. I will advise Mr. Brooks once again that although he has lost his right to be present uh, in this courtroom, he can reclaim the right to be present as soon as he is willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concepts of courts and judicial proceedings. That includes not interrupting the court. That includes respecting when the court renders a decision by way of an oral ruling, even if he disagrees with it. Um, so with that, um, I will advise him that once the jury is brought out, I will unmute him. I expect that he will be respectful of them, and I expect that he will not interrupt as the court goes through the uh, couple of final jury instructions I need to go through uh, including the reading of uh, jury instruction 160, closing arguments of the parties. And then I will turn it over to the state, but I will unmute him at that point. So should he have an objection, he will be able to state objection. I will be able to rule on it. And again, I expect him to honor whatever the ruling that is made. And if he does not do that, then I will utilize the mute function. Um, if he doesn't have it, we'll make sure he has the objection sign. And if I see that, I will unmute him to hear what it is and then make a ruling accordingly. Attorney Hopper. Your Honor, uh, two quick things. Please, could you confirm that the audio and video are working in the next courtroom? And the clerk's shaking your head. They've done that. Thank you. I don't know if you want to do it now or at a later time, but I think we should make a record as I will be displaying a PowerPoint during my closing argument, throughout my closing argument, and I'm not sure how that is projected in the next room or how it affects what we see in this room, Your Honor, but we should make a record of that at some point. Thank you. My understanding is Madam Clerk has the ability, uh, so that is displayed not only here, but in the neighboring courtroom. Um, if you would be so kind as when you start displaying it, just 
make some type of record, <clears throat> excuse me, so that the bailiff who's over there, if it's not being properly viewable, if it's not viewable, um, that we can stop and adjust sure. accordingly. Okay. Thank you. If you would like before the jury comes out, we could do a test. Yes, could we please? Please. Madam Clerk, would you confirm with the clerk over there that uh, the PowerPoint point is also viewable? They can see it. All right, and it should be this similarly to what we see. So the monitors will uh, display uh, the camera that Mr. Brooks is appearing, that is on Mr. Brooks on the left-hand side of the TV, and then the four cameras for this courtroom are on the right-hand side, but it's probably a, maybe a quarter to a third of the screen, and then the remainder of the screen is the PowerPoint. The monitors in the courtroom that Mr. Brooks is in are no different than what they are here. He would have one at the table, but he would also there would also be the very, very large TV monitor above the clerk over there. Well, it's smaller, and then the very large one over the witness stand. So okay. it would be very similar to what is here um, if he were present in this courtroom. And again, I've, uh, I know that the diagram um, it's probably not the most easily seen from a camera, but it's really no different than what I'm looking at at the moment. Um, so I appreciate you asking that I make a record of that. Um, I would further make a record that there are headphones on the table where Mr. Brooks is currently standing. He has not put them on, um, but they are available should he want them. All right, then are you turning off the all right, PowerPoint? Let us know when you need that function, and then Madam Clerk will be able to um, make that viewable in both courtrooms. Very good, thank you. All right, with that, the jury is to be brought out. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. With that, I will ask Attorney Opper to start with her closing argument. Go ahead. PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, hold on one second. Mr. Brooks, do you have an objection? Nothing? I thought I, was supposed to, I thought I was supposed to be unmuted. You are now. All right. Uh, Attorney Opera, you may start. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of nice to stand here in the middle of the courtroom, you know. All week or the last three weeks, they shoved me at the end of the table because I'm the lefty in the group. It's nice to be able to look at you all and say thank you, truly thank you. Each and every one of you, I want to express our sincere gratitude from the prosecution team, myself, Deputy District Attorney Leslie Basie, Assistant District Attorney Zach Woodchow. There's no one in this courtroom that does not realize the sacrifice that you've made serving your community in this very important task. You've put your lives on hold. I don't even want to hear from your bosses. Thank you. You've watched these proceedings and you've noticed as we sit at our prosecution table, we don't have a client at our table. But rest assured, we do represent someone. We represent the people of the state of Wisconsin. It's an entity. I can't bring it to the courtroom. People enact laws. People want to feel safe. People have representatives in Madison or Washington, D.C. that set standards, rules, that we all are expected to live by. And when those rules are violated, prosecutors step in and enforce the law. Daryl Brooks does not represent anybody. He does not have a client. Daryl Brooks is the client. Daryl Brooks is the defendant. The state of Wisconsin is the plaintiff. It's really that simple. And it's consistent with any other criminal case you've ever heard about at any other time in any other jurisdiction, it runs the same, no matter what state, state or federal. 
I'm going to ask you for your guilty vote at the end of my comments. It's up to you. I can't tell you to do anything. Except I'm going to say one thing to you that I wholeheartedly ask you to obey. Attorney Upper, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your objection, sir? Uh, mischaracterization of who I am. What is your name? Brooks. And the way it was said, uh, I feel like it, it was talking down. All right, your objections noted, it's overruled. The statement continue. You must not, not, not consider anything about Daryl Brooks other than his conduct in downtown Waukesha on the evening of November 21, 2021. Nothing he's done before that, nothing he's done since that. When you go back to that deliberation room, please obey Judge Doro. Confine your comments to his conduct on November 21 of 21. Is he guilty of the 76 counts that he's been charged with? That and solely that should be your topic of discussion. So, what are the charges against Daryl Brooks? Thank you for your patience in listening to the jury instructions. They must be read for each and every count. But sadly, they can be summarized very quickly like this as far as the actual counts. Counts one through six are first degree intentional homicide while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts seven through 67, first degree recklessly endangering safety while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts 68 through 74, hit and run causing death. Counts 75 and 76, bail jumping, and count 77, battery. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Brooks, what is your objection? Um, I have 76 charges, not 77. It's a mischaracter it's, mischaracterization of the charges. Uh, that is correct. It is uh, sustained. It should be count 68 through 73, I believe, and then 74 through 75, and then 76. Thank you, Your Honor. I do apologize for my math skills. 68 through 73, 74 and 75 are bail jumping, and 76 is battery. I apologize for that misstatement. We're going to talk about counts 1 through 67 in detail. Counts 68 through 73, hit and run causing death, in my opinion, are easily summarized as this. He never stopped. Never. Bail jumping, he was out on bail for two files in Milwaukee County facing felony charges there. He was ordered to not commit any further crimes. If you believe he can, uh, was involved in any of the conduct charging counts 1 through 67, you should find him guilty of bail jumping. Battery, that relates to the split lip and black eye suffered by Erica Peterson. We told the story kind of backwards. We started with the battery for background. First degree intentional homicide. You've seen this in our opening statement. You've heard it from Judge Doro. Did Daryl Brooks cause the death of the victim, a victim? Did he have, I'm sorry, did he act with intent to kill, meaning either the mental purpose to take the life of another or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being? Count one, Ginny Sorensen. Count two, Lee Owen. Count three, Tamara Durand. Oh, I got, I got. Count four, Jane Kulik. Count five, Bill Hospel. <clears throat> Count six, Jackson Sparks. Those are the individuals who lost their lives because of the conduct of Daryl Brooks. From there we go to reckless endangering safety. What is that? In this case, it means that through his reckless driving, he endangered the safety of other people. And he did so demonstrating utter disregard for human life. Now, 
Behind me is States Exhibit 15. It's also on the PowerPoint. If you choose, you may have this chart with you in the deliberation room to help you walk through each of these counts if you find it helpful. It's up to you. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But it will be available for you if you ask for it. And it'll take you, as we did in our presentation of the case, right down Main Street and address all the counts that were involved, all the counts that were charged. To prove reckless endangering safety, and I'm just going to go back one slide, nowhere do you see there that we have to prove any degree of injury to anyone. Never once did J Judge Doe instruct you that somebody has to be physically injured. Now, Detective Casey told you that was the standard we used in deciding of all these hundreds of thousands of people who is included in these charges. And a decision was made by the prosecution team to include people who were physically injured to be efficient in our prosecution. And so everybody up and down the street, I would argue, had their safety endangered that day. I didn't charge 5,000 counts. We selected 60, 61 counts of people that we can identify by name in Exhibit 15 that were injured by the conduct of Mr. Brooks. Those are the people in green. People in red are the fatalities. And we presented this case to you in much the same fashion that is presented here on Exhibit 15 as to how the injuries occurred going down that street. So we are absolutely held to our burden of proof and the elements for each offense that Judge Doro instructed you on, but we are not required to prove any injury to anybody. The question is, was their safety endangered by his reckless conduct, his reckless driving. Now, some of the groups, it's pretty easy. They walked in a formation, and you can get a photograph or a diagram, and you can kind of see pretty easily who was located where, right? And you can think back to the videos that you've seen for each of these groups and remember, and you'll see them again, the path of the vehicle as it went through each of these groups. This is South Band, of course. All of these names that are being displayed on the PowerPoint Exhibit 21 are on Exhibit 15 in green for Waukesha South Band. Pretty much the whole left half of the formation was endangered by the safety of Daryl Brooks driving up the side of that band. The Extreme Dance Team, it's a little difficult to read, but again, this chart was marked as an exhibit. It's exhibit number 33. If you want it, you can have it in the jury room. The names on this chart will match the names for the extreme dance team on State's Exhibit 15. All of the girls that were struck and injured as they marched with the extreme dance team, plus some people on the back that were handing out candy or serving in support roles as the uh, unit made its way down the street. The dancing grannies, States Exhibit 54, the formation that they marched in, who was located where, and your recollection of how that SUV zigzagged through that group, and you can just see the names and match it up to who was injured and killed versus who wasn't. Now, one of the big things in this case has always been, why did this happen? What was he thinking? Why did he do this? Again, those are things I don't necessarily have to prove to you. His intent, I do have to prove, and I submit without any doubt there's overwhelming evidence that this was an intentional act by Daryl Brooks and an act of utter disregard for human life. I say that for these reasons, folks. Number one, 
first and foremost, just stop driving. That's it. It's really that simple. Not one person had to be hurt that day if he would have just stopped driving. Excuse me, Attorney Offer, your objection, sir? Um, you specifically, can, I'm sorry, can, can I be heard? Your objection, sir? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know if I was on mute or not. Um, You're not? You, you specifically said in your jury instructions that intent cannot be, you can't look into someone's mind, I think is what it says, to find intent. So how could that be characterized as someone knowing for sure intent or not knowing for sure intent? You're making an argument. You'll have an opportunity to do that later. Your objection's noted. It's overruled. The state may continue. I apologize. We, sh we showed you at the very beginning. Remember, our first witness was Sergeant Warner, the man who was the incident commander for the parade. We put up another map. I think it states Exhibit 1. You can have that if you want it. Shows all the positions of all the police officers and the reserve officers the barricades, the squad cars. How do I know it was intentional? Because even Daryl Brooks told Detective Carpenter, I could tell something was going on downtown. No reasonable person would drive upon this area, see the squads with their red and blues on, see the officers in the street with their bright yellow vests, see all the people milling around, See the, pl the floats lining up and the participants getting ready and not know to drive safely, slowly, and obey officers. The barricades help us prove it was intentional. The police presence help us prove it's intentional. The parade participants help us prove it's intentional. And the parade spectators help us prove it's intentional. Your objection, sir? Speculation as to what the alleged defendant said he saw. It, sir, it was never. Your objections noted it's overruled. This is closing arguments, not the evidentiary phase. Go ahead and so turn the offer. So, how can speculation be made to what was saw? If your that objections was noted to? it's overruled. Continue, Attorney Offer. Honking the horn. Quite interesting that Mr. Brooks asked so many witnesses if they heard the horn honking. Some of them said they did at the beginning of the parade. Yeah, I heard a horn honk. Most of them said they didn't. The horn honking cuts both ways, folks. If he's honking his horn, that means he can see something's in front of him. That means he knows there's an object in the road. You can rely on your common experience in your affairs of everyday life. If you see something in the road and you want to alert the other person to your presence, you will honk. But you do not have the green light to then just keep going if they don't move. He knew they were there. Intent. Catholic community. That's just one of the photographs showing the people that will match up to Exhibit 15 from the Catholic community of Waukesha. There's a lot of photographs identifying the people that were marching with that group. The parade started. This is the starting point, or at least near the beginning, right? This is the area. We showed some videos of the groups passing by in this area. We heard testimony from four different police officers standing in four different spots near here telling of their four different efforts to stop him. Intentional. Sergeant Wanner's back here, testified that this red SUV blew by me. I waved both arms over my head. I'm in a police uniform. I have an unmarked squad, but I have my red and blues on. And he blew past me. He gets down here to the corner where Detective Casey is standing. Detective Casey runs out into the street, gets close enough to put his hand on the hood of the car. 
he keeps going. He comes down, turns on the main street, gets in this area of East Avenue to the south and Buckley Street to the north. This is where he encounters Officer Schneider and Officer Buttrin. They each make a separate effort to stop him and he keeps going. Four police officers. It's intentional. He had plenty of opportunity to just stop. Anywhere along the way, one of the officers testified to it. I think it was Officer Schneider. This was an accident, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route after passing all this, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route. At any point, all he had to do was stop. They could have paused the parade. They could have moved the barricades and escorted him out. He didn't. It was intentional. He went on for four blocks. It was intentional. He reached speeds of approximately 30 miles an hour. That's intentional. He plowed through 68 different people. 68. How can you hit one and keep going? How can you hit two and keep going? How can you hit three and keep going? Didn't phase him a bit. He kept going until he got to the end and there was no more bodies to hit. It's intentional. Mischaracterization of the evidence. Noted, overruled. His conduct when he left the parade route, we'll get into this. His flight, his hiding, his panic, his desperation to run. Get the hell out of town as fast as he could before the cops came. That shows his intent. His interview with Detective Carpenter, we spent several hours playing you snippets of that interview. How telling was that? Never once did he say any of these things. Never once did he say, like he told you in his opening statement, it wasn't an, ac it was an accident, it wasn't intentional. Never said that to Detective Carpenter. No, he came up with some convoluted story about I got a ride out here from a buddy in a tan Kia, and then I left to go meet Erica, and we got into a fight, and then I went back, and the other guy got into a fight, and he was leaving, so I took off on foot. Absolutely nonsensical story. Does not match up with the known evidence in this case. Overruled. He never stopped. I didn't even state the objection. This is closing argument. She may continue. I'm going to play this slide, which is a snippet from State's Exhibit Number 53. Go ahead and play with sound, please. Okay. snippet that I selected because I thought it really captured the environment that so many witnesses tried to explain to you, right? It's a Christmas parade. People are there with their families, their little kids, their grandkids, their neighbors, their friends, strangers, standing next to strangers. That's what's going on on Main Street. While that's going on on Main Street, this is going on. Remember this? This is the gas station on the corner of Barstow and North Street. While the units are marching down Main Street, entertaining the crowd, Daryl Brooks is driving recklessly. He's enraged and he's arguing with Erica Patterson. Why is this important? This is important because before he even gets to the parade route, this is how he's driving. He drives the wrong way down North Street and then acts like it's everybody else's fault in the world. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opera. When he finally pulls into the gas station, he rolls down his window and yells at the driver who's properly stopped at the stoplight. 
that it's somehow that guy's fault that Daryl Brooks is trying to drive the wrong way down North Street. And from there, the rage continues. We get to this point, State's Exhibit number three. The video is plain. You can see the pushing match between Daryl Brooks, Corey Runkel, Erica Patterson, and Nick Kirby. Watch this. He turns to get in the car, flips up his hood, and goes and gets in the passenger seat. I'm sorry, sorry driver's seat. How long are we going to mischaracterize testimony? Sir, it's argument. I've heard nothing improper. Your objections noted. It's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. Thank you. They need to know they can nullify. That's it. He drives off onto the parade route. From this moment, right here on Exhibit 15, you're watching it. He's enraged, he's angry, flips up that hood, and he zooms past Sergeant Warner, past Officer Casey, onto the parade route. Now there's no doubt, for the first two blocks, he does not strike anyone. And as we've discussed, some even said he was driving at a reasonable speed initially. By the time he gets past Officer Buttron and Officer Schneider in this area here of uh, East Avenue, past East Avenue, and clearly once he gets past Barstow, that's where it starts, right? That's where it starts. Nicole White, our first victim, walking with Remax and the hot air balloon, knocks her over, keeps going, runs up and over the backs of Waukesha South Band, hits the green children spectating on the sidewalk, keeps going, runs over Kelly Grabo and her daughter Adelia, walk, walking with Burris Logistics, keeps going, plows through the entire extreme dance team just before the five points, keeps going, hits Deborah Ramirez and her son Isaac spectating on the south side of the street, keeps going, clears the five points area, hits Jane Kulik square on, causing her to go up on the hood of the car and then fall off and drives over her body. He doesn't stop, he keeps going. Runs through the kids over by the steaming cup. We heard the parents testify about little Brinley and Kelsey and Owen that were standing there outside the steaming cup. They were struck by the red SUV driven by Daryl Brooks. Keeps going. Plows through the grannies in that zigzag fashion. Striking most of them. Injuring them. Killing them keeps going, gets down here to the end and goes through the uh, Catholic community. The witness, uh, remember Holly Berg, she testified about that um, mobile gas station incident. She said she was standing down here in this area. She said, I saw 15 to 20 people fly in the air. They look like bowling pins. And when she saw the video, she's absolutely right. It's a terrible description when you think these are human beings, but that's exactly what it looked like. When does the intent exist? Doesn't have to be even for a second. I'm not telling you who set out that morning to cause this carnage, but when he became enraged back here, he didn't give a damn who or what was in his way. He intentionally went on. I'll show you. Motive, I don't know why he did this. Folks, I don't know why, other than the rage. He's right, you cannot read minds, neither can I, but the law doesn't require you to. The law gives you a way to reach a conclusion as to what is somebody thinking, and it's right here. 
decide it based on his acts, words, and statements, and from all of the facts and circumstances. I've already been through many of them. I want to show you what I mean. Look at this. Was there room for him to get out? This is way back at the beginning. This is Officer Buttrin's squad video. Way back at the beginning. That's Buckley Street here that you're looking at. Look at those barricades. Look at the sparse crowd. And there's Officer Schneider in her uh, yellow fluorescent vest on the left side of the picture about to run into the street and stop him. <coughs> Intent. I'm going to play this video for you because, folks, for me, this is where it becomes crystal clear. You watch this video, the first thing you're going to see if you direct your attention to the left side of the screen is you're going to see him hit Kelly, I'm sorry, Nicole White. Knock her to the ground and keep going. Now, if that was the end of the story, you may sit here and say, Madam DA, I, I don't know how you conclude intent from that. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe he didn't mean to do it. But watch what happens in this video after he knocks Nicole White down and tell me this does not prove intent. Please play. watching the left side of your screen. drive over them and keep going. That's a still shot of the same thing. That's intent. I'm sorry to interrupt your objection, sir. How can you tell the jury what they're supposed to think? It's proper argument. Your objection's noted. It's overruled. It's, we continue. I will argue that it's, <coughs> I will say that it's improper and I Mr. move Brooks, for Mr. Brooks, I made my ruling. I'm going to mute you if you don't Follow the rules. Exhibit one. Mistrial. Exhibit one fifty two. Clearly, intentional conduct. Clearly, intentional conduct. States Exhibit ninety three. We ask the court to take time to have you go look at this car in person, because it's. Remarkably amazing <coughs> that this damage was caused by human beings. That's intent. This is an excerpt from State's Exhibit 154. Maybe a little hard to see. A lot of that laying in the front part of this uh, photo are shoes. Remember what Dr. Bidritsky said about the shoes? And the feet, the scuff marks on the toes and the ankles. Look at all the shoes laying in the street. This is the area at the end when he ran through the Catholic community. All the shoes laying there because of the velocity, remember? The medical examiner talked about the velocity. It's not just the speed, it's the velocity. The power that these people were knocked right out of their shoes. That's intent. The flight, the hiding, changing his appearance. <coughs> he had to go through some effort, right? Crawled up in this uh, <coughs> playhouse, ditched his sweatshirt and his sandal, the other sandal. Seems pretty reasonable. He dropped it when he was jumping over a fence. Changed his appearance. Please play.
excuse me. Intent. What's he running from? What's he running from if he's just a lost guy with no ride back to Milwaukee? What's he running from as there's cops, sirens wailing in the background? So state's exhibit number 130. Put that up here quickly. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, folks. Suffice it to say, after Officer Skolton tried to stop the threat at that intersection at the top, Wisconsin Avenue, and he blew through the barricades there and drove south on West Avenue over to Prospect Court, cutting through the yards and ditching the vehicle on Maple. You heard all the testimony about the commotion on Maple. The eyewitness testimony from Officer Sailors, off-duty police officer who saw this, saw the defendant, Daryl Brooks, he identified him for you in this court, get out and run from this car and how we tracked him through the neighborhood. And again, the desperation, whether he had to ask or use veiled threats like, I won't hurt you, but I need your phone. He was absolutely desperate to get out of there until he took refuge in the home of Daniel Ryder. Now remember the interesting thing, folks, none of these witnesses in this area knew anything about what happened at the parade. None of them, none of them were there. So they, some of them tried to help, some of them didn't. Daniel Ryder did, and it's actually probably a really good thing that he took him in because it stalled, right? It stalled him from keep running, kept him in one place until the cops could close in and get there. Now, Mr. Brooks repeatedly asked witnesses who had just watched their loved ones get struck by this SUV if they happen to catch a license plate. States Exhibit 150, there's the front license plate. Definitely a little blurry, but definitely you can make it out. States Exhibit 151, there's the rear plate. States Exhibit 175, there's Daryl Brooks in his music video with the same car and the same license plate. <clears throat> there's the key to the Ford that was found in Daryl Brooks' pocket. There's no doubt Daryl Brooks is the person responsible for this. Because this man in this picture is the same as this man in this picture wearing this sweatshirt. And again, it's a little hard to see, but you can ask for these exhibits in the jury room if you want. The photograph, you can see this design on the front of the uh, sweatshirt if you look close enough. This is a sweatshirt from the playset that has Daryl Brooks' DNA on it, according to the crime lab. That's him right there. That's Daryl Brooks driving off into the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That is also Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. And so is that. And he kept asking people about the tints on the window. Well, guess what, folks? You don't need to see the tints on the window when the windows are rolled down. And there's clearly one person in that vehicle in every one of these photos. And it's that man. And it's that man. And it's that man. Daryl Edward Brooks, Jr., date of birth, 221-1982, on his identification card issued by the state of Wisconsin. What is your name? Brooks. In all capital letters, Daryl Edward Brooks Jr. This was in his pocket when they arrested him. So this entire shenanigans that he's presented to you through his questioning of witnesses about I'm not Daryl Brooks and that's my name and I don't know who that is and I don't uh, consent to being called that name it's just nothing but a distraction. It's Daryl Brooks. It's the man who drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and killed people, injured people, endangered the safety of people. I'm sorry, your objection, sir? Uh, your Honor, with all due respect, I, I would appreciate the, uh, the quote unquote 
uh, language to, to what, what does she mean by shenanigans and this and that and the third? Sir, your objections noted it's overruled. The state may continue. Well, can, can she tone that back? Because if that was me, if I would have said Mr. something Brooks, like that, Mr. Brooks, your objection is noted. It's overruled. These are closing arguments. There's nothing just, improper. It's noted. It's overruled. To, she may continue. I just wanted, I just wanted to be fair. You'll have an her, opportunity to respond, sir. Please let her finish. So I can, I can rebuttal? Go ahead, Attorney Opper. Thank you. I'm going to conclude my comments with this, folks. I'm going to show you the video, a stitched together video of all the carnage caused by Daryl Brooks, and I apologize. It's together. This is important that you know what he did. It's important that you think about the women like Nicole White and Kelly Grabo and her daughter and Jane Kulik who were just there with friends and co-workers supporting a local business. The teenagers marching in the band representing wearing their school colors. It's important. The boys and girls with the Blazers baseball team and their coaches doing nothing more than handing out baseball cards. The young girls in the extreme dance team. Can you imagine how many hours they spent practicing that routine? He drove right through them without a care in the world. The grannies dancing their way down the street. Perfect step, every one of them. Catholic community there, as Father Matt said, spreading the light of Christ in the weeks before Christmas. He snuffed it out. It's time for Daryl Brooks to stop running. It's time for him to stop lying. It's time for him to be held accountable for his actions. Daryl Brooks cowardly rammed his way through this parade, violently killing and injuring so many people. I'm going to stop talking and play this video, but please, I ask you to add up the evidence, use the map, one, I'm sorry, 15, you can check off the names, we've covered them all. Walk down that street like we did with you, return guilty ver verdicts on all counts, please. Please. Screen back up. Thank you. Before we continue with Mr. Brooks's closing arguments, I am going to take a short break. Um, all rise for the jury, please. Come on, muted. No. <clears throat> the jury should know that they can nullify. You are muted now. Thank you. We'll be in recess for about 10 minutes. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is now present in the main courtroom. Uh, prior to reopening following the break, I did invite him back into the courtroom, and he is here. I trust you are ready with your closing argument, sir. I'm ready to address subject matter jurisdiction as well, too. That request is denied. Just for the record, I was addressing it for both courtrooms here in courtroom number, I think it's 20. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to bring the jury out. Are you prepared to present your closing argument. I would like for you to prove subject matter jurisdiction on the record, Your Honor. 
I'm not addressing that any further than I've addressed already, sir. There's a written decision. I remind you of that. And that written decision, did, did I receive, uh, well, actually, I didn't receive anything. Was there copies made? Mr. Brooks, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you prepared with your closing argument? I'm going to have the jury brought out. There is no I'm other in, legal arguments I I'm need to address of, from you at this time. I'm informed of what you're saying. I was merely asking, was there copies made of your, you say, a written decision? Sir, my, record, my written decision has been filed into the record. That is done electronically. You are provided with a written copy previously. Are you asking for another copy of that, sir? Yeah, because I, I don't have it. As a courtesy, I'll have my clerk print off a copy and provide that to you. Is it proven subject matter jurisdiction? Your objection to the lack of jurisdiction has been noted repeatedly on the record. It is a meritless argument. I've indicated that in my written decision as to why there is subject matter jurisdiction, and I will continue forward with the final stages of this trial, which I hope include your closing argument and then the final instructions to the jury. I will hope it, it, it proves subject matter jurisdiction on the record too. All right, I will instruct the jury to come out for the record. The written decision is once again being provided to the I defendant. accept for value and return for value this document as it is not based in lawful law and it does not prove subject matter jurisdiction whatsoever. It refers to a, some complaint that was filed in uh, the name of a trust, not my name. Were you aware of that, Your Honor? Mr. Brooks, the jury has been asked to be brought out. I mean, I've requested that they be brought out. They're on their way. Were you aware of that? Please be prepared with your closing argument. Were you aware of that, Your Honor? Or is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant? All rise. So that is a tacit agreement. Record to reflect the jury is coming out. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Go ahead, sir. You may begin your closing argument. I'm not ready to begin closing arguments. So this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument to the jury. Please start. I've uh, started the timer uh, in, of one hour. I'm informed of that, Your Honor, but I'm not ready to proceed as I don't understand the uh, reason why the questions asked before the jury was present were not answered. There, there are issues that needed to be addressed outside of the jury, as you always say, which I don't understand why the jury deserves Mr. to Mr. Brooks, this know. is your opportunity to present your closing argument to the jury. Please do so. I'm informed of that, but the jury needs to understand the truth, their rights, and their duties, as they have not been informed of their truth, their rights, and their duties. Mr. Brooks, the court has begun the instruction process. Uh, I read 73 <coughs> pages this morning. And into the early afternoon, I have another 30 plus pages to read. Did you inform They will be informed of the law. Did you inform them that they Mr. can Brooks, notify the law? Mr. Brooks, you do not have that right to request that. And Were I'm they advising informed? you one more time. This is your opportunity to provide your closing argument. Please begin. I intend to. When ready, I just want to know if the jury was informed that they can nullify the law. Uh, Mr. Brooks, are, you have they no have right the to power. make that argument to the jury. It's true. They have the power. Oh, all right. I'm going to excuse the jury. They should, they should know that they have the power. Please rise for the jury. <coughs> Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Brooks, you do not have a right to request jury nullification directly from this jury. I direct your attention uh, to the Bajerkas case, B-J-E-R-K-A-S-S, -S, that's State versus 163 Wisconsin 2nd 549. While you are not incorrect that the jury has the power to nullify, they don't have the right to do so, and no party has the right to instruct or to request an instruction or to argue jury nullification. You may talk in terms of fairness in general terms, but you may not go further. You may not argue that the jury should discard the instructions and the law. 
uh, and find you not guilty for that reason. You may not use the phrase jury nullification. You've done that now at least three times in earshot of the jury. Uh, twice uh, while you were in the other courtroom, I was able to mute half of what you said the second time, and then of course you raised that once again while in front of the jury just now. Um, you also indicated you weren't um, ready to give your closing argument. Sir, this is, the time has come for you to give your closing argument. If you choose not to do so at this time, then you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument by your conduct. I haven't made any such choice, so you can't coerce me into a constitutional right uh, waiver when I have not waived the constitutional right. And I will not allow you as a public servant to do that. I have not made a choice. Sir, this, the time has come for you to present your closing argument. Are you making a judicial determination that you're denying me a constitutional right in open court I have not court made such a record. determination as of yet, but you can forfeit your constitutional rights Under by what conduct. Under what lawful law? Uh, Illinois versus Allen, State versus Anthony. Illinois versus Allen does not reference anything pertaining to uh, rights when talking about In closing State statements. State versus Anthony, uh, Illinois the Supreme versus Court Allen. of Wisconsin referenced both that decision uh, when it essentially extended the reasoning or adopted the reasoning of Illinois versus Allen uh, to then find that a defendant could forfeit an important constitutional right by conduct. In State versus Anthony, it was not the right to be present in the courtroom, it was the right to testify. Okay, so no, none of those the reasoning, that you just named have anything to do with the closing arguments, Your Honor. You, you've used Illinois versus Allen repeatedly to when it comes to me being removed from the courtroom. Not one time did it bring up anything dealing with a closing statement or a closing argument. So how is that same uh, statute being used for something that it doesn't even refer to or pertain to? Mr. Brooks, the Allen decision, Illinois versus Allen, and the Anthony decision, which is State versus Anthony, are two examples of cases where a defendant lost a very important constitutional right because that right was forfeited by the conduct of that particular defendant. And that was to be present in trial, correct? The right to present a closing argument is no different. Because it is not evidence, um, it could be said that it doesn't even rank as high as the right to testify, which is guaranteed by the constitutions. Which I was denied the I'm right to I'm not prepared to, to make that to ruling to. here yet today, but I will tell you this, sir. The time has now come for you to present a closing argument. There will be no further delays. It's I not will a delay. not be taking any further um, adjournments for you to prepare. You were advised yesterday that this court would proceed today with instructing the jury and with the parties making their closing Arguments. And you made that while it violating up, my constitutional sir, right. Sir, please don't interrupt me because well, you've now you interrupted did. me a couple of times. No, once. So let's Twice. make that correct. Once. That's the third time. Okay, now you can say So, two. Mr. Brooks, I'm advising you yet again. The time has now come. I don't consent to being That's that another name, interruption. Brooks. The time has now come for you to present your closing argument to this jury. And you were brought back over to this courtroom for that purpose. I'm going to let them That's know. That's another interruption. No, I'm going to let them know that they have rights and that they should be told, informed of the truth. It's not me are trying to give. Are you telling me, sir, that it's you not are going trying to, to give. Dis Let me ask you a no, question. Hello. I'm not trying to give any sir, jury instruction. Sir, you're interrupting me and you haven't let me finish. So are you telling me that you are going to disregard my very clear directive to you to not bring up the topic of jury nullification? That's not what I said. I'm asked, that's why I'm asking you. I don't understand that question because that's not what I said. Sir, you may not argue jury nullification I'm to this jury. I'm going to inform them of the truth. So you're going to inform them that they have the power of jury nullification. They do have the, you just said on the record that they have the power. For, Sir, uh, I direct your attention You just said that. Did again. you not just say that, Your Honor? Sir, you the said jury, I couldn't instruct them. 
The jury has that. the power, but not the right to nullify. Right. A you said pardon, the power. You said the listen power. Listen to me, sir. You're interrupting me once again. So I'm going to inform them that they have the power. Are you telling me, sir, I'm that you are you going no to I'm not telling you no such thing. I just told you what you just said. My directive to you to not raise the issue of jury nullification during your closing argument. That's not what I said. You just read and said that they have the power to. That's what you just said, Your Honor. Sir, State versus Vijerkas says and stands for the proposition that although the jury has the power of jury nullification, ah, they have no, the power. no party has the right to argue for jury nullification. I'm not arguing for it, Your Honor. In I just want them case, to be informed. The, I just want them sir, really to be informed. You can That's call it. call it informing, making them aware. Yeah, they, should, they should be aware of the You are not rights. allowed to make them aware of their power to nullify. That how is an improper them, argument. Your Honor, how can I not inform them that they have a power? How because can I not, not inform right them of a power that they have? Them. I'm not giving a new jury instruction. That That's not what I'm is arguing. There's no jury instruction for jury nullification, yeah, sir, I'm not, because I'm not, it's not allowed. I'm not attempting to give them a new jury instruction. I'm merely attempting to inform them of the power that they have. Mr. That's Brooks, not against the law. I'm advising you one more time. You may not raise the issue of jury I'm going, nullification before this jury. I'm going to, I'm going to inform jury. them of the power that they have. I'm not you are giving telling them, me that I'm not you giving are them a jury instruction. I'm telling them about jury nullification. That's, that's what I hear you saying. That's not what I said, though. Don't mischaracterize what I'm saying. You just read and said that they have the power. They have the power to do that. So how how is informing it's an inherent them? Inherent power that they have. They are not to be instructed on it. That I'm, is very clear in the law. In addition honest. to no, let me finish. In addition to the case that I just cited, I'd cite to you uh, from the jury instructions, uh, the law note on jury nullification 705. Um, what that says, sirs, I'm not going to read it all. It's many, many pages. But the bottom line is it is improper for a court to allow a defendant or a defense attorney to make an argument or make the jury aware um, that they have the power to nullify a verdict. And Your Honor, you just added this last night. That's why I had to sit there for an hour in the holding cell and wait for you to change the whole paperwork because I brought that up. So you never intended for this to even be an issue. Mr. Brooks, it never was brought up. If you but think then I when I raised the issue, you Your Honor, let me finish. you think that I'm not prepared to deal with an argue on jury nullification? I didn't say, I, that's not what I said. That's you not what I said. In all fairness, that's not what I said. The record should accurately reflect that you were kept in that holding cell Why was I kept so in there? that my clerk could finish adding a jury instruction that was not there. Six verdict forms, and it's times two because there's a guilty and a not guilty okay. for each. No, let me finish. So, how did, so how did I have, why did I have to sit here for that where I could have just went to my cell and had it delivered? We had this Mr. at the Brooks. end of last at the end of last night before you call recess. I'm not going to debate we had that a whole, topic with you further. We had a whole further. conversation about Mr. Brooks. You me are bringing up about the jury nullification, disregarding this court. You, re Here we you go can with this. roll your eyes Here at me we, because all you want. It's ridiculous, Your Honor. You 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 just stated that they have the power to nullify. Would you Any like, law, if you would like, but then I will I said, read this to you, sir, the part of the case that's important, but you're not letting me get a word in edgewise. I'm trying my best not to remove you to the other courtroom, but that is oftentimes what I need to do in order for this court to make a full record without you interrupting me. But you need to be fully aware that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in front of this jury. It is not an allowable argument or an advisement or making them aware. However you want to describe that, sir, whatever verbiage you want to put in front of it, you may not do so. And this court has the power and the authority to limit what you say to this jury, even in a closing argument. And if you're telling me through your conduct, through your words, that you are going to disregard that direction, you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument. Under what lawful law?
under State versus Anthony. That's that it doesn't refer to that. State versus it, Anthony it may doesn't. not have dealt with. It hasn't dealt with closing the right arguments. Right to a closing argument, sir. It, but the reasoning, you just said nonetheless, it right there. is no. fully applicable. No, because you can't. The more you can't change the law, Your Honor. You can't change the law. That's practicing law from the, the bench. Law, sir, but the general principle. I know you used to be in legislation, but you can't practice law from the bench. Sir, I'm you not can't practicing do that. law from the bench. I you have, are if you're changing. If you're, ch Your Honor, I'm not you're making, attempting. You're attempting to make a a a, a separate case. Pertain to something here that it that, that doesn't even pertain to it. It has nothing to do with a closing argument. Nothing that you just so, named. Not Mr. Illinois Brooks, versus Allen. I would like to make a record. Would you please show the courtesy and respect? For I will, you to Your do Honor. That? I will. All right. So looking at the Anthony case. All right. And that case, starting at Head Note Seven, Paragraph Fifty Four, says the following. And you need to let me get all the way through it. We have recognized two distinct ways in which a defendant may give up his rights, waiver and forfeiture. State versus Pino is the first citation that they reference. Waiver is the intentional relinquishment or abandonment of a known right. Multiple citations there, I won't repeat them all. Waiver typically applies to those rights so important to the administration of a fair trial that mere inaction on the part of a litigant is not sufficient to demonstrate that a party intended to forego that right, state versus Soto. Forfeiture, on the other hand, often involves the failure to make the timely assertion of a right. That's a cite to the Dina case and Olano. Rights that are subject to forfeiture are typically those whose relinquishment will not necessarily deprive a party of a fair trial and whose protection is best left to the immediacy of the trial, such as when a party fails to raise an evidentiary objection. However, there is a second aspect of forfeiture, doing something incompatible with the assertion of a right. State versus Vaughn, 2012 Wisconsin Appellate 129, citing Illinois versus Allen, 397 uh, U.S. 337. They went on, the court, that is the Wisconsin Supreme Court in Anthony. As previously noted, we have held that the right to testify is subject to waiver, not forfeiture, insofar as a defendant's inaction in asserting the right is concerned. We now conclude that the right to testify may, in appropriate cases, be subject to forfeiture where conduct incompatible with the assertion of the right is at issue. They go on to discuss Allen, which was not a right to testify, but was a right to be present. And I am utilizing the guidance from Illinois versus Allen and State versus Anthony. It directly guides this court that a defendant may forfeit a right by conduct by doing something incompatible with the assertion of a right. In this particular case, you are very clearly telling me you are going to disregard what I told you about notifying the jury about nullification. You have absolutely no right to raise that in front of the jury. It is improper. And unless you're willing to tell me you will honor this ruling of mine, then you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument. That is my ruling. I object to that ruling, Your Honor. I object to that ruling. Are you willing to make a closing argument, sir, that does not reference jury nullification? I'm going to inform, inform the jury of their power. Again, I never stated that I was making a new jury instruction. I never sta in, uh, stated anything like that. And every case law that you just stated made no reference to closing arguments. It was all pertaining to uh, being present for the proceedings of trial and for testifying. Sir, Not what one I'm time did you, you, hold on, I let, Your Honor, with all due respect, I let you make your record. I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. Not one case law that you just cited made any reference whatsoever to a closing argument. Not one. So how is me merely informing the jury of the power and the rights that they have? How is that 
a forfeiture of being able to give a closing argument. Well, in addition to the cases I've just cited, sir, I'd also point you to State versus Bajerkas, 163 Wisconsin 2nd at 549. Well, that's a, lot of, that's that's a, a court of appeals cases, case from 1991. That is the first published appellate decision in Wisconsin to consider directly several issues relating to the jury nullification issue. In that particular case, the court very clearly said that the defense counsel in that case was allowed to talk in terms of fairness in general terms, but not to go further and could not argue that the jury, quote, should disregard the instructions and the law and find her not guilty because it seems fair. That's a description of jury nullification. To use the words jury nullification would run afoul even more. And so I am telling you that given my inherent authority in controlling the mode and order of this court to ensure courtesy, decorum, and civility, and to ensure that this jury is presented with arguments that are proper under the law, I am hereby telling you I am in, in creating a rule for your closing argument that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in any way. Your Honor, hold up. Hold up now. I'm the only one that has to be made rules for for closing arguments, but not the prosecution. How is that fair? How is that balanced? Mr. Brooks, I'm squarely faced with your defiance regarding the issue of jury nullification. It's that is defiance. requiring it's me not defiance. to address this issue and to tell you very Honor, expressly I that that is the rule I vehemently for your object closing to that. argument. I vehemently object to that. Your objection is noted for the record. But May I ask for a legal reconsideration stands. of your ruling? That request is denied. May I uh, respectfully ask for... Uh, Matter of fact, I reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling. Your for the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling? Not one pertaining to being present in the courtroom or testifying. One that specifically talks about a closing argument. All of those requests are noted and will not reconsider. I've put my findings and my reasoning on the record, and I stand by that record. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? I'm not the forum for which an appeal would be sought, sir. I cannot well, answer that. You, you referred to it before. You would need so to direct your appeal to, a, confused, your to Honor, a court of appeals, not this court. No, this is... I'm supposed to be in this admiralty court because you haven't, you haven't, is the, if, if we're under Article 3, then we should be in common law court. That hasn't even been addressed if we're in a common law court or an admiralty court. That's a baseless argument, sir. I don't and even need to what address law it. In fact, based on what law in fact? It's meritless. Based on what law in fact? Sir, I intend to bring this jury out and give you I'm informed, an opportunity I'm informed of that. to present a closing argument. Yeah, if but you you're violate, also, you're please also, let me, listen, sir, you're interrupting you me yet rule, again. You just tried to put me under a rule that no one else was put under. The circumstances require that I implement this rule, sir, given your the stubborn defiance on your the honor, issue that's of jury nullification. To my defense. You can't place me under certain rules and not place the prosecution under the same rules. Sir, the circumstances of this case and your insistence on arguing jury nullification has resulted in this court creating this rule. I haven't argued it. I said that I wanted to inform the jury of their power. I never once said, I'm going to make an argument. I'm going to give them a jury instruction. You may not advise them that. or make them aware in any way that they have the power. And why not? Of jury why can't they be informed of their power? Because powers? it would violate the Bajerkas decision, sir. Violate what decision? All right, sir, I am going to bring the jury out. And I'm going to inform them that they have the power. And if you do that... I will dismiss the jury, and I will declare that your right to present a closing argument Under what has been law? forfeited based upon I make oral, how I've outlined I make that today. I'm not going to declare that at this point because I want to see what you will do. 
Uh, but if you raise the issue of jury nullification, I will immediately dismiss the jury. You will forfeit your right you can't to do that. Uh, present a closing under argument. Under what lawful law can you... And then if you continue to interrupt me... Under what me, lawful law... You will be removed to the other courtroom as I complete the So I'm being held in contempt again. Is it civil or criminal? Your Honor. Right. Go ahead. I apologize. May I ask the court to consider perhaps an alternative, and I fully respect the ruling the court has just made, and I understand the basis for it. We all know the defendant in his petulance will say jury nullification in the first three seconds the jury's in the room. Objection the to that. Proper I don't thing think to do, I, I think, Your Honor. Stop interrupting, Attorney I don't think Ocker, I should please. be talked down to. Allow him to make his closing argument. I will object if he misstates the law. You can instruct the jury to disregard any misstatements of the law. And we continue in that fashion, if possible, for a reasonable amount of time. And if it becomes to the point where there's no reasonable, legal, credible argument that's being made, then the court can decide as to whether or not he's forfeited his right to a closing argument. But we could at least try to, by merely objecting and the court telling the jury to disregard and instructing Mr. Brooks to move on to the next topic, we could try to allow him his opportunity to provide a closing argument. If that's unworkable, then I think this record will be very clear as to the efforts of this court. And I think um, there there is materials in the bench book, or I'm sorry, the jury instruction 705 um, that talk about a jury instruction this court could even give um, telling the jury that they are not at liberty to disregard the law, but we're not going that far yet because, um, frankly, you have told them and you will tell them that closing arguments are not evidence. And um, I think they will abide by that. So I know it's going to require um, effort for the court to, to allow this to um, allow Mr. Brooks to try and proceed. But I think we should try that or something similar to that in an effort to get through this next step or else we will continue at this pace forever. I'm certainly willing to try that. It's about all we could come up with, Your Honor. I mean, I'm certainly willing to try it in this courtroom and the, if he disregards that to excuse the jury and then have him present from the other courtroom would be the second step and then third would be a forfeiture. Your Honor, I object to that. <clears throat> Your objection is noted for the record. That will be the course of action that this court takes. The first time you violate uh, the rule, you may be subject to forfeiting your right to be present where you will give the closing argument from the other courtroom. Um, and if you continue in a blatant disregard of the requirement that you not reference in any way jury nullification, I may make that final determination outside the presence of the jury. I object to that, Your Honor. All right, with that, let's bring the jury For out. For the record, may I respectfully request the legal reconsideration of your ruling? So is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer my objection, Your Honor? I decline to reconsider. I reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling, Your Honor. Noted for the record. For the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling, Your Honor? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law on this issue, Your Honor? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? I'm not the court to address that. For the record, may I move to stay these proceedings until this instant matter is adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction, which this court has no right. subject matter jurisdiction. Denied. Under uh, the based on what law or fact? For the jury, please. Based on what law or fact? Because I'm going to inform the jury of their power. They deserve to know. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Go ahead, Mr. Brooks. Your closing argument, please. Good afternoon. It's been a long day. First off, I'd just like to start by uh, 
letting you guys know that uh, it's a lot of information that you guys should be privy to, I believe. And uh, one thing that I believe that you have not been privy to is the truth of your rights and your duties being the jury. Um, the fact that you and you alone have the power, not uh, well-prepared DAs with well-prepared and clearly rehearsed uh, speeches and, and exhibits and a lot of theatrics, frankly, not the judge. You and you alone have the power. You and you alone decide what is truth and what isn't truth. You should be informed that you have the power to nullify any law that you don't agree with. Objection. Move to strike the statement. Sustain. Objection. I will strike from the record the last statement made by the defendant. The jury is, will disregard it. Which is clearly what I've been saying. I believe that not only is it fair, but it's essential that you be privy to all knowledge, not knowledge that certain people feel that you should hear and shouldn't hear, disguised under the color of law. The fact of the matter is, just like I did with uh, my opening um, statements, I don't have a well-prepared or rehearsed speech. I didn't look in the mirror and say certain points to myself over and over again to make sure I have them right or, or anything like that. I've chosen to speak from the heart in my opening statements, and now I'm going to speak from the heart. What you won't hear me do is argue facts. And the reason you won't hear me argue facts is because I believe that it takes away from what should be recognized. The tragedy of this event, it should be recognized. Trying to argue facts of this, facts of that, I'm not going to waste your time doing that. It's a little emotional. I apologize for the long pause. It's hard to keep everything together emotionally. Um, and honestly, I don't believe that I have any more tears left. Uh, it's, it's been a hard year for the families, mostly, and that should not be lost on, on anyone. It, and it shouldn't be taken away. I said it before and I'll say it again. It's a lot of people that are, are healing, that are attempting to heal. That opens the door to talk about uh, forgiveness for a little bit. With every healing process, there comes a, a forgiving process. It's not an easy thing for anyone. Uh, what you've been hearing from the prosecution, and not to take anywhere with, uh, anything away from them, but let's call it what it is, you've been hearing a lot of rerun. Same things over and over and over. No different than when you turn on the radio and you first hear that song that you don't like when you first hear it but they play it so much that eventually you start saying it, the words to yourself before you even realize it. And then you sit and you go, I hate that song, why am I singing? That's what's been happening, rerun, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Attempting to make things stick in your head that simply aren't true. Why do I say, what am I saying? I say, look at the testimony. You know, the, the, the thing from the prosecution here has been intent, 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 intent. We all know what's been said. We all know the picture that's been painted. Even the prosecution said themselves. How can you look in somebody's head and say, this is what they intended to do? You know, for, for a year I've, I've sat and gone through this feeling so powerless. You know, letting other people run with the narratives. Sitting back helpless while other people paint a picture that has zero truth. Zero. I understand about healing myself, tragedy, pain, all that. A lot of it, there's no need to get into. I myself in my own life have had to do a lot of healing. As a man with children myself, I find it hard to believe that anyone who's really had conversations with me, spent time around me, would think for one second that this is an intentional act. I've never heard of someone intentionally trying to hurt someone while attempting to blow their horn, while uh, attempting to alert people of their presence, which brings me to more information that I believe that you should have been privy to, and I'm sure that the prosecution will beg to differ, but the fact of the matter is, 
the vehicle in question, make and model of 2010 Ford Escape, the vehicle in question, actually 2008, 2009, and 2010 of that model was in fact recalled. Objection, misstatement of the facts, facts not in evidence. Was in fact, for argument, Your Honor. Sustained. Was in fact recalled, was in fact a class action lawsuit against Ford Objection, for those model evidence, for those model vehicles. Sustained the juror will disregard. Information that you should have been privy to, that you weren't allowed to be privy to. Why? I don't know. That information, malfunctioning throttle bodies. Mr. Brooks, move out. It's information that you should have been privy to. Vehicles that malfunction and accelerate not being able to be stopped. Objection, that is It's information, accurate. it's There's information. No Hold on. Go ahead. Move to strike statements by Sorry Mr. for Brooks. the interruption. There are facts not in evidence, Your Honor, and it's a complete misstatement. Sustained. How is it a misstatement when I have the information? Mr. Brooks, move on. This is information that I feel like you needed to know. You should have known. Information that was taken away from you. Why? To prove a case? Information that you definitely should have been privy to. DA says the defendant has an utter disregard for human life. Utter disregard for human life. Not realizing that they're talk about a, talking about someone that has, again, has children. Talking about someone that watch their children come out of the womb and be born into this world, cut the umbilical cord, held them before their mom even did it. Moments that I'll never forget. And yet they say disregard, utter disregard for human life. They made reference to a rage as if they were, or if this particular DA was right there, standing right there, as if this DA is a psychiatrist. I said to myself, what? Rage, what do you mean rage? How can you characterize that? How can you have the audacity to diagnose what someone's brain is? It, it, where it's at, what it's thinking, why it thinks the way it does. DA makes references to blocks of no one being injured, but then says it's intentional. You add that up with the supposed rage, the supposed intent to harm and kill, and it doesn't, doesn't kick in until well within blocks. And maybe it's just me, but I would think if I was characterizing someone with this intent to kill and, and, this, and this, this rage and this anger, then why weren't people immediately harmed? That does not make sense. Why would someone with intent to kill and rage try to alert people of their presence, repeatedly honk their horn? You, you heard a detective, if you recall, testify that the vehicle that he observed was not only honking his horn, but was not speeding. So where does this rage kick in? Where does this insatiable <coughs> intent to kill kick in? They speak as someone who's known someone for years, which brings me back to the vehicle. What if the vehicle couldn't stop because of the malfunction? Objection, fact, not in evidence. What if, what if the driver of the vehicle was unable to stop the vehicle? Because of that fact, what if the driver may have panicked. So that make the driver a, a crazed, or not crazed, a, 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 a rage? Does that make the driver in a rage and intent on killing people? DA played a exhibit 17. You don't see anyone struck in that vehicle. On that exhibit, you don't see anyone struck. With someone who had this intent to kill, this rage, as, as she says, if that was their intent, wouldn't they have taken the opportunity to his many people as they could, target people, mow down people. Reference was made to this vehicle, the damage. Says this is all caused by bodies, but then later turns around and says, hits barricades and other objects. For her testimony about hearing loud crashes and, and, and things of that nature, but the DA wants you to believe that this all came from people. Evidence doesn't support that. So I go back to trying to wrap my head around everything that's happened in the last year. Praying for those families, praying for the people that tragically lost their life. Because that should not be lost either. The fact that there was lives lost and all the emphasis has been put on the alleged defendant. People have been disregarded. Makes me wonder, 
Does the DA even care about those people? There's been prayers going up every day. It's been suffering on both sides. It's been threats, hate mail, because of the narratives that's been put out there. The misconceptions that have been put out there. The lies that's been put out there. Lies that have caused my children not to be able to go to school, to be bullied. For my mother to have to leave her home and stay at a hotel because she's afraid for her safety. Because she gets hate mail shoved through her, her mailbox. My nieces and nephews to fear for their safety. And what's been equally hard is not only having to answer the questions from my daughter who was seven at the time, my baby, my baby girl who was seven at the time, is now eight, attempting to ask, answer her questions that she's asking and still continue to shield her from what she sees, what she hears. Having a newborn son that I haven't even been able to meet I haven't been able to hold, touch, kiss, having to navigate everything that comes with this whole situation while still attempting to wrap my head around it. I can't honestly say how many times I've sat in my cell, especially during Lights Out, alone, where it's just you, and just been praying and asking myself, how could this happen? Not just for the people, but for everybody involved, the community too, how could this happen? How? The hardest questions you can ask is those that don't have an answer. No matter how much thinking you do, no matter how much you try to look at it from different perspectives and listen to other outside perspectives and listen to people that you trust and that you love, still coming up with nothing. But to think for one second, one, one, one question I never had to ask was if this was intentional. That's something that never even, I never asked once because I know it wasn't. As a matter of fact, it never even crossed my mind to even attempt to ask myself that, because I know it wasn't. And I know sometimes during this trial probably doesn't show, maybe hard to believe, but trust me when I say no one outside of the families that had to go through this, no one's heart is more in pieces than mine. So again, I go back to all these exhibits, go back to everything that's been shown, everything that's been testified to, everything you've heard, during this whole process, this trial. And again, I say the same thing that I said earlier. Same thing I said in opening statements. I'm not reading from any paper, any books. Everything you've heard in opening statements, everything you're hearing now is from right here. Everything. You have the decision. You and you alone. All of you. You have the decision. I'm sure you've taken a lot of notes during this process. Some days are longer than others. A lot of movement in and out of the courtroom for various reasons. Remember the power that you have. Don't for one second let it be taken away from you. I can never understand the position of sitting on a jury in, in something of this magnitude. So I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure. I pray that the right decision is made. The right decision. So almost like that, um, that message well, not message, but that writing. We're in our vehicles, and it, we have that rearview mirror, and it said things are closer than they appear. But it's also another way of saying sometimes things aren't as they appear. I can't speak for anyone else, but me, myself, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's so how I was raised. That's what I believe in. None of us are perfect, but I try every day to make sure that I acknowledge him. That's why every time I step in this courtroom, I have my Bible with me everywhere I go. I even read it on breaks, recesses. This is not something that started at the beginning of this incident. This is something that has been instilled in me since I came out of the womb. This is how my family lives their life. This is how we was raised. For whatever mistakes that I myself have made in my life, I've made peace with, with God, made peace. I'm happy to say that my conscience is clear. And because I believe, I trust him with my life. Nobody will never know why it was his will for this to happen. <coughs> a lot of lives were changed that day, mine included. <coughs> God's way is not our own. And no matter how much sometimes we want to question, we have to have faith. Look inside yourself. Look inside yourself and make the right decision. Look inside your heart. You have everything in your hands now. Everything. Do what's right. Do what's right. 
Don't let the smoke and mirrors take away your power. Don't let the theatrics take away your power. Each and every one of you has a decision. It's right. Make the right decision. It's hard to think about my younger kids getting older and at some point having to explain everything to them. Kids don't stay kids forever. And nowadays, kids is frankly a lot smarter than we were when we was kids. i tell you that much. I got a letter the other day. My youngest daughter, she's still learning cursive right now, so she's the best writer when it comes to cursive. She'd rather print. She said, Dad, and this is from the letter. She said, Dad, why are people saying all these mean things about you? I haven't read the rest of that yet, letter yet. The rest of that sentence said, that's not the dad I know. Throughout this year, I've been called a lot of things. And to be fair, I am a lot of things. A murderer is not one of them. Never has been, never will be. Before I close my statements, I just want to say open your hearts. Go inside yourself when making this decision. Have no fear. Pray and do what you know is right. What you know is right. Think about everything you've heard. Think about everything you haven't been privileged to hear. Think about the whole entire picture. And above everything, whatever you decide, make sure you yourself can live with it. Make sure you can live with it. That's the magnitude of the power that you have. Just like this tissue is in my hand, this is everything. You have everything. Be at peace with what you decide. Have no regrets. Don't let this decision weigh on you after it's over. Hopefully we got a long, lot, lot of living ahead of us, Lord willing. Don't look back and kick yourself in the behind. It's been about three weeks with you. It took a lot of courage and a lot of guts to pause your life for this, to put important things on hold, to, to basically stop your life. You should be commended for being able to sit up here with this amount of pressure. I want you guys to know that's not lost on me. I, I'm sure... It's a lot, and you all should be commended because it, it, it took courage to do this. I don't know, but I would bet a lot of people wouldn't want to be sitting in your position right now, and you guys had the guts to do it. Thank you for that. Thank you for taking pretty much a month and setting it to the side for this. I know it's probably not proper, but you, you guys deserve a round of applause if you could get one. Thank you guys sincerely, and, and I know and I, and I have faith and I trust that you guys know what's right. Ladies and gentlemen, I, just, I don't think it's fair to just say guys, but I believe in your heart you know, you know what's right. Does that make sense? Ladies and gentlemen, I am not making any sense. None of this makes sense. And so you have to remember, when you're in that jury room deliberating and conjugating the Emancipation Proclamation, does it make sense? No. Ladies and gentlemen of this supposed jury, it does not make sense. Then, if Chewbacca lives on Endor, you must acquit. The defense rests. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, before I give the state an opportunity um, to present rebuttal, please stand for a minute. So please stand. Have a seat, please. And Attorney Opper, I did time both closings. You have 1328 left. Thank you, Judge. I don't think that'll be an issue. We gave peace a chance. Now it's time for war. Folks, let me just say this. Mr. Brooks stands here and professes to speak to you from his heart. He plays on your sympathy. He talks about his children talks about the hardships that he's encountered and his family's encountered. And he brushes over the loss to the community. He wants to talk about how he's never held his newborn son, never once acknowledges the Sorensen family, the Owen family, the Duran family the Hospital family, the Kulik family, 
Sparks family. Never once. It's nice that Mr. Brooks can get letters from his loved ones. I don't know why he did this. I told you that. But actions define a person. It's that simple. You can stand with the Bible in your hands all day long and profess to be the finest man under God that you can be. But when you drive through a parade route and roll over children, children with band instruments, to the extent that your vehicle heaves up and down, your intent is known, Mr. Brooks. It doesn't have to be guessed. It's known. You don't have to stand and wonder as he claims to. For him to keep going after he drove over those children in the band and have Jackson Sparks fly off the front hood of his car, lifeless, and keep going and have Jane Kulik fly off the, light, the hood of his car, run her over, and keep going. I'm not going to go on. You get it. You need to look in the mirror, Mr. Brooks. If you want to accuse me of practicing my closing <coughs> argument, you need to look in the mirror, sir. Your actions are that of a murderer. You murdered these six people. You endangered the safety of 61 others. There are 68 victims in this case, folks. That's not an accident. That's not a, gee, I woke up one day and don't know how I found myself in this position. If you have some explaining to do to your children, Mr. Brooks, I recommend you do it. Now, members of the jury, the duties of the parties and the court have been performed. The case has been argued by the parties. The court has instructed you regarding the rules of law which should govern you in your deliberations. The time has now come when the great burden of reaching a just, fair, and conscientious decision of this case is to be thrown wholly upon you, the jurors, selected for this important duty. You will not be swayed by sympathy, prejudice, or passion. You will be very careful and deliberate in weighing the evidence. I charge you to keep your duty steadfastly in mind and as upright citizens to render a just and true verdict. You are to decide only whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the offenses charged. Any consequences of your verdict are matters for the court alone to decide and must not affect your deliberations. You must make a finding as to each count of the information. Each count charges a separate crime, and you must consider each one separately. Your verdict for the crime charged in one count must not affect your verdict on any other count. This is a criminal, not a civil case. Therefore, before the jury may return a verdict which may legally be received, the verdict must be reached unanimously. In a criminal case, all 12 jurors must agree in order to arrive at a verdict. When you retire to the jury room, select one of your members to preside over your deliberations. The presiding juror's vote is entitled to no greater weight than the vote of any other juror. If you need to communicate with the court while you are deliberating, send a note through the bailiff signed by the presiding juror. To have a complete record of this trial, it is important that you communicate with the court only by a written note. If you have, any, if you have questions, the court will talk with the parties before answering, so it may take some time. You should continue your deliberations while you wait for an answer. The court will answer any questions in writing or orally here in open court. When you have agreed upon your verdict, have it signed and dated by the person you have selected to preside. After you have reached a verdict, the presiding juror will notify the bailiff that a verdict has been reached 
Everyone will return to the courtroom. The verdicts will be read into the record in open court. The court may ask each of you if you agree with the verdicts. Before I swear the officers, I will, uh, we will determine the alternates. And then I will have all of the civilian bailiffs and deputy bailiffs that will be in charge of the jury during their deliberations and sequestration. So we have placed each one of your numbers in the tumbler. I'm going to draw three numbers. Those numbers will be the alternates um, who will nonetheless be sequestered in the event we would need to call upon one of you to replace another juror. The first number that I am pulling out is 10. The second number I am pulling out is 30. And the third number I am pulling out is one. I want to confirm that I still have 12. I know Madam Clerk did it, but I will also do that to be sure. And I just confirmed that the other 12 numbers were in there. I will need all of the deputies and civilian bailiffs to be come up and be sworn on the record. Clerk to court pause, why don't you join them just in case you're needed? All right, would you all please raise your right hand. Do you swear that you will keep all jurors on this trial together in some private and convenient place and that you will not allow any person to speak to them or you speak to them yourself except to ask whether they have agreed on their verdict and that you will not before they render their verdict communicate to any person the state of their deliberations or the verdict they have agreed upon, so help you God. All right, and then Madam Clerk will just make a record of who you all are. All right, and here are the jury instructions as well. For the record at 624. All rise for the jury as they're excused to begin their deliberations. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, just so the record is clear, the alternates, of course, will not be uh, participating in the deliberations. They will be in a separate jury deliberation room um, and will only be called upon if needed, of course, after consultation with um, the parties. As far as how late I will let them deliberate tonight, we have ordered dinner for them. I believe it will be here shortly. Um, and I really will leave it up to them as to how late they want to deliberate uh, before they would want a break and then to retire for the evening. They are under a sequestration order, so they will be kept separate and apart. Their electronics have been confiscated, um, and they will um, not be going home uh, until verdicts have been reached or they are discharged from the court, whichever would occur sooner. Anything? Uh, else the parties would want me to address at this moment from the state. From the state. Thank you, Jay. Anything from you, sir? Yep. <clears throat> so essentially I would have to stay here while they're delivering. I'm gonna be able to go back to my unit, use the phone, shower. Mm. It is shower day for my pod. We only get <laughs> two shower days a week. I don't so here's what could happen though, sir. I don't have a problem with you doing that, but they could have questions. And then so, and then you would need to become available so we could address any questions. They may ask for exhibits, uh, things of that nature. So as long as you're willing to come back for those things, I don't have an issue if, you know, I, I probably should talk to the COs or at least the sheriff and make sure there's, I'm not stepping on their toes since they're in charge of all of that. Um, but it's possible that we get a request for exhibits, some exhibits initially that would, I wouldn't be surprised if we got that. Um, so let me do this. Let me confer with the Sheriff's Department. I don't initially see an issue with that, but I wanna make sure that they have a protocol in place and that that's what they would like to do as well, okay? And one more thing. Go ahead. I was, um, 
I was curious. Uh, 61 charges for the uh, reckless. 61 injured parties did not testify. So how does that work? How 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 the how essentially how are charges able to be charged if all the injured parties did not testify? From my perspective, sir, the state uh, presented their theory of the case, and there was sufficient uh, evidence uh, regarding the charges to go forward to the jury. Um, I can't further explain it from there because that would, for me, that would require me to explain the law. Um, and I guess that's all I can really say about it at this point. I got a um, point, though. I'm sorry? I got a point, though. Um, I'm not going to comment on that, sir. Um, of course, the state bears the burden of proof. Um, and they have to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, for better or for worse, sir, I was not presented with any motions to dismiss, either at the end of the state's case or the close of the evidence, regarding any legal arguments you may have had regarding those issues. Um, and so at this point, um, the jury has the case, and they will determine their verdicts. If there are issues of law that you want to raise after the verdicts are received, um, then you'll have to make that determination. Yeah, that, that has to be raised because it's essentially you can't, if no injured party testifies, then it shouldn't be a charge. I disagree with that characterization, sir, but there is frankly no motion in front of me based in law or fact, so for me to comment any further would require me to give an advisory opinion, which I'm not um, willing to do. So you're saying I need to make, make a motion? So what I will say at this point is I do have one issue that I would like to raise with the parties. Um, I frankly would just, I need a break a little bit. I mean, obviously the court has to stay open. Um, I know my dinner is coming um, and I think it's uh, reasonable. I need to put a few things together, but I do need to make a record of some information that I received earlier today um, so that the parties are advised of that. But I will do that. Um, um, let me confer with the Sheriff's Department about your requests. Um, I'd like to take about, a, in about 30 minutes, address the issues that I need to address or the issue. Um, and I, I want to find out if that would interfere with your request about taking a shower and all of that. So um, if you can hold tight and stay with us for a little bit, um, that would be great. And I'll confer uh, with the Sheriff's Department and have a more definitive answer for you shortly, okay? Can I get my filings? Um, you want the, we have, you want the originals back. If Madam Clerk has scanned them all in, and they're uploaded, I don't have an issue giving you the originals back. They will have the date stamp. They don't have a time because they were filed in court. Won't he put the time on? I also, so that you, they were in there, printed them after I scanned them in so it has a document number. So you're getting two copies. So you'll have that, okay? See, so I didn't interrupt you, see? I'm sorry? I said, see, I didn't interrupt you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Unless there's, I would like the parties back in about a half an hour. Thank you. Unless they have a question sooner. Your Honor, do I have to go in that holding cell or do I got to get to go? So I wanted to, oh, I need my court reporter. I'll wait for her. Thank you. All right, it's 7.05. We're back on the record. Um, I wanted to advise the parties that earlier today I received information from the clerk of court um, that she had received an email um, that uh, the person sending the email had found a post on Justice for Dale on Reddit, so it's a subreddit. I'm not familiar with how Reddit works, but um, and that the thread on the Justice for Daryl Reddit site uh, was claiming to be a member of the jury pool. And I am going to provide the parties with the information that I was given this morning. It's a color copy 
um, of the attachment and the email that was sent. Um, I, the email was received by the clerk of court at 9, 10 a.m. Um, then my clerk received a notification at 9.30 a.m. that uh, the clerk of court wanted to speak with me. Uh, you may recall this morning I stepped off the bench for a little bit of time. I read through the information that was provided to me, which was an email, and then the attachment, which is a color print off. Looks like it, the person took a screenshot in that the anonymous post claimed to be a member of the jury on the case, and here are my thoughts on the trial and on this subreddit. And apparently, again, it's a subreddit uh, called Justice for Daryl. Uh, all those, uh, Justice, the number four, and Daryl, all, no spaces. Um, I then uh, had contact with uh, Captain Dussault advised him that this should be investigated and basically turned over the matter to law enforcement for a full investigation. At this point, or at that point, I made a determination based upon my review of the information that I would not stop uh, what was happening in terms of the trial with the instructions to the jury and ultimately the closing arguments and then turning the case over to uh, the jury for deliberations. And um, of course, I, am concerned about the integrity of these proceedings and I will take whatever action that I deem appropriate once a full investigation um, is done. But at this point there is uh, no, I would say, credible information that this is in fact a member of the jury. Um, but I will leave that for law enforcement to determine and if of course, if need be, at the conclusion of the case, when the jury reaches a verdict, um, I certainly will consider whether any questioning of the jurors at that point is warranted. Um, so that's the information I wanted to provide. Again, copies of this information will be provided to the parties, and there is a full investigation underway by the Sheriff's Department. I have no further information about it at this time. I will not be the judge that will further be reviewing it in terms of any requests related to that investigation. I will simply be handling whether uh, any requests as it relates to this case in particular. And I hope we have the copies for the parties. From username Anonymous Brooks Juror, posted on r slash justice for Daryl. Anon writes, I am a member of the jury on this case. Here are my thoughts on it and this subreddit. So to start with, I obviously shouldn't be here. I'm not allowed to look stuff up about this trial or really have any connection with the internet. But nobody actually follows sequestering rules anyway. Hence, I am posting anonymously. Here is my opinion on the trial. First off, I think it's pretty obvious due to the chain of custody that the defendant is, in fact, Mr. Brooks, and he did do it. However, I have had throughout this trial doubts about various aspects of this case. Number one, the judge is clearly biased against Mr. Brooks. I got that feeling from her when we were in the room, and my eyes have been open to how she acted towards him when the jury was out of the room. Clearly, she is not an impartial judge and has been trying to belittle, demean, bully, and pull procedural tricks on him fairly frequently. I had my doubts, but the subreddit has shown it to me clearly. Number two, Mr. Brooks has clearly not been given a chance to plead his case in court. He has been silenced and mocked at almost every turn. While he may be a bit loud or crass at times, I still believe he deserves to be heard. Number three, I do have significant doubts about subject matter jurisdiction. I didn't understand it when discussed in court because the defendant was repeatedly silenced, but I do understand now thanks to this sub, and I agree that subject matter jurisdiction is of great concern here. Number four, this subreddit has made me aware of jury nullification 
and I am grateful for that. Overall, I'm not sure what I will decide. I'm not educated in law, and I have to admit I'm biased against the defendant for the horrible acts he did. However, it is also clear that this trial is a complete kangaroo court. Mr. Brooks has not been allowed to try and prove his innocence, subject matter jurisdiction, or even the circumstances surrounding the events. It's hard to imagine what could justify it, but we just can't know because of this trial. For these reasons, I'm torn between locking him up and throwing away the key or jury nullification. Both have arguments for and against them, and I'm not looking forward to choosing. I'm mostly writing this to help myself process my thoughts on this. But please let me know what you think. What is this? All I can tell you, sir, is that there is apparently on the internet, on a site, or maybe it's an application, I'm not entirely sure, called Reddit. There is a subreddit um, that is entitled Justice for Daryl, and it was on that subreddit that someone wrote an anonymous post claiming to be a, one of the jurors. That, of course, would be a violation of the rules that I set up for the jurors. Uh, which is why I turned over the information to law enforcement so they could make a full and complete investigation. Uh, for the record, I accept uh, for value and return for value these documents. Uh, I'm, I'm confused. I'm At this point, sir, I'm providing the information. Um, I trust that the parties will review it, and if a party believes that any request needs to be made of this court, <coughs> then an appropriate request will be made. Um, but at this point, I'm just advising the parties of the information that I have. And I will add this. Um, I will, of course, um, it's important that the results of any investigation be turned over to the parties. I don't know how long that will take, um, but um, that is also my direction. That was the, really the only direction I gave to law enforcement is that, that uh, the results of the investigation that be turned over to the parties. Was this, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was, was this just found out about this morning? Um, yes, the email that was sent to the clerk of court was received at 9, 10 a.m. Um, and then that email <coughs> and the attachment, um, I'm aware of a second, I will say I'm aware of a second email that was sent to our clerk of court at 10.02 a.m. And any, I think there, when we stepped off the bench uh, following the case being given to the jury, I was advised that other emails had been received throughout the court system. And I simply said, obviously that information needs to go to law enforcement. I haven't seen it, haven't reviewed it. Um, but any person who works in the clerk of court's office who has received an email will be, that email about this topic will be forwarded to the sheriff's department um, their forensic unit is handling the investigation, to my understanding. Attorney Upper, did you have a question or something to state? Yes, Your Honor, I just wanted to state for the record that I have also received similar emails at my office this afternoon. They were sent not to me directly, but to the district attorney's office website. And um, I only wanted to point out that in viewing the contents of the posting, well, first of all, all the emails refer to the exact same posting and the language is the exact same in all the postings. Um, in viewing the contents of the posting, uh, we question the veracity of the posting because it refers to things that, quite frankly, are not true. And um, also, uh, upon reviewing it, Your Honor, we came to the conclusion that it does not exhibit any material prejudice against Daryl Brooks that may affect the veracity of any verdict that may be returned in this case. The posting is largely critical of the court and to some extent uh, the prosecution, but it, the, the nature of the posting is actually in support of Mr. Brooks. That's why it's under a subreddit called Justice for Daryl. And I don't believe there's any reasonable reading of this post that would lead someone to believe that it suggests the juror harbors substantial or material prejudice 
against the defendant. Thank you. I appreciate the additional record. Can I say something, Your Honor? Go ahead. Um, just briefly skimming through it, I, I do want to state for the record that I have no involvement with this. I'm fairly, really, like, shocked like this even came to light. Um, I will say, just by skimming through it, these are definitely things that have been talked about in the court. So we have to, I mean, common sense would say that this came from someone that has either been in the court to hear what goes on in the court or a, a jury member. There's, there's no other way. Well, actually, because the, the proceedings are live streamed worldwide, Your Honor, available on YouTube worldwide. So I don't agree with that assessment. Well... I mean, it's pretty obvious that this would come from somebody who's actually, I think it's pretty clear. Well, I am leaving it in the hands of law enforcement to do a full and complete investigation. Again, I take the integrity of this process incredibly seriously. And if there were to be a juror who violated the rules, I would take that very seriously. And I will not hesitate to take any action that I deem appropriate at this time. It is simply being investigated. This was an anonymous post. And um, if either party believes any further action needs to take place as it relates to this particular jury, then I trust they'll file the appropriate request with the court. So with could, that, could uh, the courtroom, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Something else, Attorney Amber? A different topic, Your Honor. Oh, sure, possible. go ahead. While we're all together, I just wanted to address exhibits and what the court's procedure would be we have no objection to any exhibits going back to the jury room if they are asked for uh, and precluding the requirement that we all assemble every time a note comes out asking for one exhibit. Um, so as long as we're all here and we have some time, maybe we could discuss that. Well, I'm willing to discuss that. Do you have any position on that, sir? Yeah, uh, I would object from the standpoint that uh, I would need to see any exhibit that's being asked, asked about and the relevancy of that exhibit being asked for. I think that's only fair. Exhibits that are that have been received, a relevance objection um, would no longer be valid because the court has already ruled on the relevance and the admission of the exhibits. The issue is whether it goes back to the jury room. I'll give you a, a for example. Um, sometimes in a trial there are medical records that need to be filed in their complete form under the statute, but really maybe only a portion of it would go back to the jury, or depending on why they were offered and whether there was any medical testimony regarding a diagnosis, for example, could impact that. Sometimes there's privacy issues with an exhibit, if there's a social security number for a witness or something like that. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the exhibits have been received, um, and uh, the jurors can ask to view photographs, written documents. They can even ask to view the videos. The videos would need to be done one of two ways, either which requires everyone to assemble because we do have the technology to play them directly to the jury room, uh, but that simultaneous with that is it would be played in here. So everyone would be seeing what's being played in the jury room at the same time. So that does require the parties to be in court. Uh, and that allows the jury to continue with their deliberations, talk about what they're seeing, etc. So can so, the jury see it here now? No, no, no. I'm talking about a video. We have the ability to play it directly. There's a TV. I, I should have said that. Probably not too, you, why would you know there's a TV in the jury room, right? So there's a TV monitor in the jury room that is connected to the technology in the courtroom. So whatever is playing here could be a still photograph, could be a document, could be a video. We can play in the jury room at the same time. Um, but as far as other exhibits. Um, so it would be only the exhibits that's been Received. Received. So Correct. nothing new. Nothing's going to come out of the blue and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to. 
only what's been received during the trial. If it would be helpful, I can have Madam Clerk give you the printout of the exhibit list that shows everything that's been received, if you would like. That's about like 7,500. <laughs> There's a lot of exhibits, but, a lot of exhibits. but I'm willing to have her print it off if you would like it. I, I think it would be helpful just in case. I'm guessing at some point that will come into play. Right. For example, they may come back and say, we'd like to see exhibit 15, which is the map, uh, the large map from of the parade route. Okay. Um, they might want to see the other map. Maybe they want to look at a video. Um, there's a lot of exhibits, so I'm not going to, I guess, speculate what they want. Um, sometimes they write notes to us and say we want, they literally list out all the exhibits that they want. Other times they'll say, can we have all the exhibits? So sometimes parties do stipulate. Um, that's what the state, I think, was trying to get at. Um, so do you have a position on that? If, if the jury requests an exhibit, do you want the court to rule on it individually? Or do you agree that if they request an exhibit, it can be released to them? A uh, rule on it. All right, fair enough. Anything else, Attorney Opper? Yes, we had discussed uh, yesterday, and I'm not trying to get too far ahead of myself here, but um, what was the time limit that the court wanted to uh, work off of for uh, giving notice to the parties when the verdict is available? 30 to 60 minutes. Okay. And they would go, again, where they are being sequestered, and then we would reassemble tomorrow morning if that's what is needed. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else from you, sir? Um, yeah. Um, did you talk to the Joe, the deputies? Or I did. You Thank you for that reminder. Um, the jail has asked that I follow the standard operating procedure, which is to have you in central holding and not up at your cell. But if need be, I'm willing to <coughs> order that they give you a shower later, um, if that's helpful, whether it be tonight or tomorrow morning, okay? So even though you're going to stay close by, um, I'll make sure, I'll work with the jail to make sure that you're given that opportunity um, after we're done for the night, okay? Yeah, at least let them let me take a shower. So I've and been told I'll have there to. is a question that will be coming out shortly, so oh. don't go anywhere. <laughs> don't choke me, Judge. What? I said don't choke me. Choke you? Yeah, because I'm, you know what I'm about to say. What are you about to say? Subject matter jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> you knew I was about to say that. Sir, I'm not going to address it. I already have. All right. There are requests for three exhibit. I need to know the uh, number to tell the parties who the four person is, because I'm not going to say the name on the record. Um, they have a request for three exhibits, 15, 5, and 55. You said 15, 5, and? 55. So I can pull. I was going to say, I don't know. I know 15. 15 is the map. 15 is the map, yeah. Any objection to the map, sir? It, yeah, I want, I want you to rule on everything. Well, I was going to go one by one. So I'll start um, with exhibit 15, which is the map. What's your position on that, sir? Um, my position is, um, at this point, what is the relevancy of the map? I think it's been seen a million times. I know it by heart now. That's probably the only one I know by heart. Well, um, what's the state's position? Yes, we absolutely. There's no reason not to send that back there, Your Honor. There are 76 counts that they need to work through and to assist them in identifying which victim is which and which group they were with and where they were on the road. Absolutely. There's no reason to hide that from them. It's helpful to them in their deliberation. All right, I will uh, send Exhibit 15 back to the jury room. It is an exhibit, and there really is no reason not to send it back that has been identified by the parties. All right, the next exhibit is Exhibit 5. That is the photograph of Eric Patterson. Oh, I definitely object to that, um, seeing as how uh, it was supposedly two incidents, one one of which didn't even happen, <coughs> which uh, the prosecution 
sent paperwork to acknowledge that it never happened. So I don't even. Uh, it's too dicey with that. What what incident would would five be referring to? One of which the never battery happened, count, and then one. I don't even know what I'm looking at if I look at five. What's the state's position on five? Again, Judge, there's no legal basis to exclude that from the jury. There's nothing prejudicial. It's a single photograph. I should say overly prejudicial. It's a single photograph of a single person showing the injuries that are alleged to be associated with count 77. It's directly relevant to their deliberations. There is no count 77. It's count 76. 76. You are correct. It is count 76, not 77. See why I'm confused? Well, there is an amended information, and I clearly instruct the jury in 76 counts. Be that as it may, um, I'll find that uh, it is proper for Exhibit 5 to go back to the jury, and that will be sent to them. Now, Exhibit 55 is a video, so my uh, inclination, and I'll hear from the parties first, but and then I'll give you my inclination. So, any objection to playing for the jury exhibit 55 what exactly is in the exhibit 55 i don't i don't it's a video from curry insurance facing eastbound showing the grannies being struck we could put it up if you want to preview it your honor go ahead and we are requesting that it be viewed by the jury in their deliberation room what I can tell you, if I do allow it, since I would have to ver we'll verify that the technology is working, um, and then I would play it for them twice through. And we would watch it at the same time as they're viewing it. Theirs is just me in the jury room. All right. Your response, sir? Um, yeah, I don't object to it. Uh, let me keep this in order. I guess my objection would be... Uh, Will be hard. It would be hard to say why the jury will, will um, request it. I don't know. I'll just let you rule on it. I, I don't particularly. There's so many videos that's kind of like the same video anyway. Well, Exhibit 55 was received by the court. It's relevant to the uh, charges in this case, and I will show it to the jury. I will uh, work with. Uh, Teresa and then the jury bailiff uh, to ensure that the technology is working when it's up and running. Um, I will play that for them uh, twice through. This is what I have proposed to write on the note back to the jury <coughs> as it relates to all three. Exhibits 15 and 5 are attached. Exhibit 55 will be played for the jury two times, hyphen the clip is 15 seconds. Um, and then I will initial that and date it. Any reason why we need to be played twice? Um, and I just would note that the jury four person wrote yesterday's date. Um, it is the 25th. My date will be indicated. Obviously, they didn't get the case until today, so it's just a Scrivener's error on their part, putting the 24th versus the 25th. They don't have their technology with them, so I can't really fault them <coughs> for that. All right. Any Madam reason Park, why we need could... to be played twice? Um, that's my practice. At least on short video clips. Um, so what about what, what about if they request for a long video? Then I'll make a determination then. I find that <laughs> since we have the new technology, it's easier just to do that and play it twice than to bring them out and for them to say stop and then can you go back and can we watch it again because that's my experience. So I'm really trying to avoid that. So we'll stay out here. Um, <clears throat> we'll work to, uh, they'll have to pause their um, deliberations so we can interrupt them and give them the exhibits and then uh, make sure the technology is working. So if the state wants to have that ready to go. I set for value and return for value to these documents, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, the video was played twice. We'll wait and see if they have any other questions. Uh, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Uh, about this uh, Reddit, is that how you say it, Reddit? That's my understanding. Um, this particular person is who the email was sent from, the person at the top of the page? If you have the email that has the 910 AM, that's my understanding, yes. It, were they identified to have any connection with the trial in any way? 
I'm leaving the entire investigation in the hands of the sheriff's department. I'm not, I can't answer that. I'm sure they're looking into it though, because that's a good question. All right, um, I'm gonna step off. Obviously the courtroom remains open. And we'll let you know if there are any additional questions. Procedures. Subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor. I decline will to we, address that, sir. Will we be addressing it for the record? Um, I wouldn't go too far Mr. Brooks? Well, what's the significance of seeing it as different speeds? It, was that in the question? They just said, can we see Exhibit 55 at 40% speed? Obviously, I don't recall specifically if this video was shown at a reduced speed, but many of the videos were shown at reduced speed during the trial that was allowed. I think it's proper to also show a video clip to the jurors if they request it at reduced speed. So I'll grant the request. What would be the significance? The significance is the jury's requesting it, sir. I'm saying at that speed. That's their request. I can't tell you the significance for them. I don't want to speculate, but I think it's proper given the technology that we have available and what was done during the trial. So I will allow it. <sighs> so why even ask me if I have a position? Because that's what I'm required to do, sir. But you're not required to address subject matter jurisdiction, which hasn't been proven for the record. I'm not allowed to answer any questions I ask. From your name, Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to relitigate name. your case right now. I mean, and I've made my decision on subject matter jurisdiction, so your request that I address it once again is denied. Of course, of course, it's denied. Of course, because you can't prove it on record. I'm Come on now. It has yet to be proven. It has to be proven at some point. Or do I got to go through the song and dance to get it proved? That's 40% speed? Yay, nay. The video clip is now ended. Would the state just confirm the speed at which it was just played? Yes, 40%, Your Honor. Thank you. Great. Let me know if there's another question. The court's going to step off. Obviously, we'll remain open. Um, at 747, uh, the four person um, provided a question through the bailiff. We request exhibits three and four. Exhibits three and four are videos. They are the videos from White Rock, I believe, elementary school, door one and door two. How long are each? Exhibit three is four minutes and 14 seconds. And exhibit four six minutes is six minutes and 58 seconds. Seven minutes. Okay. My inclination would be to play each one one time since they're a little bit longer and play them one after the other. From the state? Agreed. From the defense? Objection. Noted for the record. Any specific reason, sir? Um, the uh, significance of both videos. Their evidence, sir. And the jury's requested to look at them. So I will be playing them for them. We'll do exhibit three first, and then exhibit four shortly thereafter. Would you be addressing subject matter jurisdiction on the record? Um, no, I will not. Is that a judicial determination, Your Honor? Can you say what started at three? I can't. Oh, you're not asking me. <laughs> Is that a tacit okay. agreement, right. Your Honor? All right, they are ready. The arrow in the middle of them. Oh, we can get rid of that clear annotation. Is that a tacit agreement, Your Honor? Go ahead and play Exhibit 3 in its entirety.
can stop that one. They're asking it to be stopped. Any objection from the state? No. no. From the defense? No. Okay. All right. Let's switch to exhibit four. Any objection to stopping that video? No. All right, Mr. Brooks? No. All right, it'll be stopped. Uh, Judge, for the record, this one was stopped at 1.38. Do you know what time we stopped it on Exhibit 3? 35 seconds, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I think you might want to stay close by. Was that a good way we reach the state? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. I advise that the jury would like to... Uh, be done for the evening and come back tomorrow. So I said uh, they should assemble. We'll get the alternates because they're still they're sequestered. I'd like to uh, break for the day. I need to um, basically tell them that because they're breaking for the day, they should not continue their deliberations while sequestered until they're back in the jury room. Are we on the record? Uh, we are in the record. So does it matter jurisdiction? I decline to address that further, sir. Will it be proven for the record? Sir, my earlier decision, I stand behind it, my written decision. Your written decision is not based on any law or fact? Hold on. Cool. <laughs> I think they're assembling the other alternates. They're in a different place. So I have to get every... Yes, we do need them to get the instructions. Yes. I thought it was two people that got excused from the jury. Three. There were 15. No, I'm saying I thought it was two from the 16. No, only one. Well, you did say two. You said one had got excused before, and then another one was getting excused. No, I only excused one. We've had 15 since the first juror was excused. So what happened to that second one that had the COVID scare? What happened with that? Mr. Brooks, I addressed all of that on the record. I'm not rehashing that now. No need to get in your feelings. It's been a long day. I'm tired too. I would agree. But I'm not, I'm just letting you know I'm not going to rehash that stuff. I, I was just, uh, I just thought you said two. You said two on the record. All right. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The record to reflect, I have the 12 jurors who have been deliberating, plus the three alternates <coughs> who were sequestered in a different uh, jury room. Um, I want to give you kind of a modified 
uh, instruction from the one that you've heard many, many times throughout this trial. Of course, for the 12 who have already started to deliberate, uh, do not deliberate unless you're in the jury deliberation room. Um, and that will mean from when you are discharged here tonight until you come back tomorrow in the jury deliberation room. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until you are deliberating in the jury room. This order is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. Do not use any electronic devices such as a mobile phone or computer text or instant messaging or social networking sites to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. I realize you are sequestered. We've taken away all of those things, but I'm just going to keep reading through this. If you come in contact with the party's lawyers, interpreters, or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the party's lawyers, interpreters, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversation about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene, either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the Internet, or any other electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics applications or tools with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by any other means. If anyone does so, despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. I know you're not going home. You're going to uh, another location, but do not discuss this case among yourselves with any other juror until you are back in the jury deliberation room tomorrow. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result uh, in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at the trial. With that, you are all excused for the evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. All rise for the jury. All right, thank you everyone. We are in recess. We'll see everyone tomorrow morning at 8.30, um, 8.30 a.m. I trust that uh, the jail will give you a shower, so whether that's tonight or tomorrow morning before you come back to court. Yes. But I will order that. In the morning, just 8.30? 8.30. I'm not giving that day. He's got to be such a nice type thing. That's when we start court every morning, sir. No, it hasn't been. You see?